I simply wish to give my personal uh, welcome to all of you to this uh, meeting, which is very informal, as most of you know, and which is now at its, uh, I don't remember, something between the 8th and the 10th edition, uh, but it, it becomes now a sort of a tradition, uh, uh, normally here at the Scuola Normale, but sometimes also in other locations. And uh, I don't uh, wish to add anything, and I let to the chairman of the first section, uh, uh, Mauro Stenner, to introduce the first speaker. And thank uh, to all of you for being here. Okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction, and now we can start uh, <laughs> with, yeah. <laughs> We can start uh, with the first speaker of the morning session, Professor Stefano Baroni from the International School of Advanced Studies, CISA, from Trieste, who will speak about a multi-scale protocol for simulating the color optical properties of complex molecular species in solution. So, please. Thank you, Mauro. Uh, I may not. Good morning, everybody. And uh, let me start by thanking uh, Enzo for giving me the opportunity to be with you today. I'm really thrilled for uh, at least uh, two reasons. This is uh, the first time in uh, 37 years that I give uh, a scientific talk in this, in this city. The last time was uh, when I graduated at the University of Pisa too long ago to remember, but already said how long ago. It was. And uh, the second reason uh, is I feel a bit like, I uh, don't know how to say in English. In Italian, I would say a fish out of the water. So uh, speaking to you of uh, molecular properties is like uh, having uh, Enzo speaking about astrophysics, which as I understand, uh, he is going more and more frequently. So this uh, relieves me a little bit. And uh, I wish uh, that uh, even though most of what I'll be saying uh, is uh, familiar to you, I wish uh, it won't be too wrong. And uh, above all, that uh, you'll find uh, some of it of some interest for you. <coughs> so I was uh, brought into this business by, by pure chance. Uh, I was contacted by a food manufacturing company uh, that, for reasons too strange to tell, uh, knew that uh, we, I was, uh, my group was working uh, on uh, the optical properties of complex systems. It was not natural dyes at that time. It was uh, photo, uh, uh, phot, uh, photoelectric devices. Uh, but I was brought into this uh, business uh, of uh, natural dyes that actually uh, I came to learn uh, have uh, are a class of uh, molecules that have a pretty large uh, market, mainly in the food, uh, in the food industry and uh, mainly in uh, the Western world. And uh, it is a market that is uh, growing steadily, basically because of the drive in Western countries uh, towards uh, healthy food uh, and uh, uh, safety of uh, food and, uh, and stuff. And particularly, this company is particularly concerned by the fact that uh, in uh, the late uh, uh, 2000s, in 2007, uh, a study funded by the National Food uh, Agency in the UK found out uh, that a number of uh, artificial colorants uh, that uh, are used uh, uh, to make candies, allegedly would favor hyperactivity and attention deficit uh, in children. Uh, I think uh, very few scientists would agree uh, on this conclusion, but you know, when you have uh, a child, that's, uh, 
it's uh, better not to give them uh, candies rather than uh, uh, to have any risk on their health. So there is a huge drive in, the, in this continent, in the European uh, Union, to substitute natural, uh, to substitute artificial colorants with uh, natural ones. And the problem is, uh, that uh, these guys, these uh, food manufacturers, uh, don't want any color. They don't really care about natural color. They care about uh, the color they use to be claimed to be natural, but they want the precise hue of color that the consumers uh, are used to. Uh, also, uh, colorants have to be stable, that natural Molecules have the nasty tendency not to be. Uh, colorants to be found uh, in fruits and flowers rot. And uh, uh, whereas, uh, if uh, you want to use them uh, in, uh, in uh, the usual manufacturing process, you want them to be stable. Of course, uh, they, they have not to be poisonous. So uh, nature is is plenty of, uh, uh, of poisons, right? Uh, the, the, something being natural is not synonymous of something to be safe. Uh, this is something that uh, the big public uh, often uh, overlooks, but of course, uh, this is a very important problem. And uh, they also have to be inexpensive. Uh, usually, natural colorants uh, are extracted from uh, juices and that the extraction process uh, is uh, uh, very uh, expensive, usually. So uh, this is another concern of uh, these people. So for reasons uh, that uh, I won't uh, comment uh, on, this uh, uh, company that outsourced uh, some of their research uh, to us uh, are interested in anthocyanins. As uh, you know much better than me, Anthocyanins uh, are a class of are the molecules that uh, give uh, their color to uh, grapes, a number of uh, flowers, to aubergines, to berries, uh, to uh, leaves when uh, they red when uh, uh, when they they become uh, red in uh, in the autumn. So they are responsible for all the gamut from blue, from red to magenta, purple, and, uh, and blue. <coughs> so, uh, of course, uh, it seems that there is a little room for design when uh, you want to uh, when you want to, to use the natural products, actually not quite so. On the one hand, uh, uh, for a molecule to be classified as natural, it is not, I, I don't know the, the legal framework, but it is not necessary that it is exactly what it is extracted uh, from, uh, from, uh, from a juice, from a plant. So there is uh, some freedom uh, to, uh, to the manufacturer to uh, uh, to manipulate the, uh, it a little bit, and also uh, uh, design may help selecting the, uh, the right, uh, the right uh, uh, molecular species from uh, a mix of, of many different molecular species that, uh, uh, that, are, found, uh, that are found in nature. So uh, the color optical properties of Ah, it doesn't work. So the pointer, I think it's because of the surface is, uh, is, too, is too glossy. <laughs> uh, so the color optical properties uh, of, uh, this, uh, uh, of these anthocyanins depend uh, on the number of uh, features such as chemica, uh, chemical uh, diversity. Uh, the acidity of the solution or the present in solution uh, of agents of molecular species that by themselves would be uh, colorless, would be transparent, but uh, in, uh, pre in the presence uh, of an optically active uh, 
molecule, they would uh, mo uh, modify the optical activity of, uh, of the pigment. Uh, these molecules are highly reactive. Uh, this is why they tend to rot. Uh, so, uh, uh, because of the same reason, uh, it is uh, difficult uh, to uh, synthesize them, or so uh, uh, I am told. And uh, uh, little research is being made, uh, is being done in this area, and uh, most of the research uh, is. Uh, uh, is targeted at isolating the, uh, the, uh, the molecules from uh, natural sources, which, uh, as said, is, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, the, is rather expensive and difficult. All in all, uh, very little is known about the microscopic mechanisms that determine the stability of these molecules and uh, the uh, uh, chromatic properties, or in our language, I would say oh, about the relation between the chemical structure, the geometric structure of, uh, of the molecule, the, the dynamical properties that ensure this uh, uh, geometrical structure, and uh, the property we are the function we are interested in that is color. Uh, most of what uh, I'll be saying uh, is, uh, will be about uh, one of the simplest and most uh, paradigmatic uh, members of this family of molecules, so that is uh, cyanine. Cyanine is uh, the specific molecule that gives uh, blue berries and or the dark berries, uh, black berries, uh, and, and the like, their, uh, their color. Uh, it is found uh, in aubergines. Uh, it is found uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in red wine. So you see uh, the, how the color depends uh, on uh, the acidity. This is something that uh, takes uh, no chemistry to know. Uh, let alone understand, uh, but uh, uh, to know that the color depends on the acidity, it's enough uh, to, uh, to taste a berry in uh, a blueberry in the spring when it is uh, red and very acid, or in late summer when it is purple or black and it is very sweet. So uh, these uh, uh, molecules uh, uh, turn from uh, red in very, or reddish or predominant, predominantly red uh, in very acidic conditions to purple and blue in, uh, 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 in uh, basic conditions. Uh, in between, uh, the, uh, as, uh, as it is illustrated in this slide, the uh, the inter at in the, in the intermediate acidities, the, uh, the solution becomes uh, mainly colorless. So the purpose of uh, this research is uh, to predict what the color of a solution uh, of a given molecule is, knowing, knowing the chemical composition of uh, the molecule, and the environmental conditions that, uh, as said, uh, will uh, include uh, acidity, temperature, uh, copigments soluted uh, in the solution, and so forth and so on. So the first, uh, conceptually, the first uh, step of our journey will be to derive the molecular structure from the chemical composition, and uh, as uh, I will try to convince you, the structure is not enough. We need the structure and we need the dynamical properties for reasons uh, that span different uh, time scales, as I'll try to convince you uh, shortly. From uh, the structure, uh, we all like, it's our job, to uh, derive the electronic structure. And uh, from the electronic structure, we uh, we compute absorption spectra, and uh, from absorption spectra, we, th uh, we can simulate the color that uh, a given solution will display. Uh, as uh, I was uh, uh, mentioning before, structure is not enough. You can, uh, we are all used uh, to find uh, the minimum energy structure or minimum energy structures 
if uh, a complex molecular system has several uh, local minima of a given molecule, but we all know that uh, molecules would uh, flicker. They would fluctuate uh, because, uh, uh, because uh, of, the thermal, uh, of thermal fluctuations. And uh, here is a cartoon of uh, what happened. The, I don't know why the second movie doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't show. There should be a second movie on the left. The left and right would depict two internal degrees of freedom, bond lengths, bond angles, you name it, as a function of time. As you see on the right-hand side, I, I have, uh, I have uh, reported a few spectra calculated on the fly over a molecular dynamics uh, uh, trajectory. You will see that uh, uh, there is little in common. Different, uh, different snapshots have very different spectra. The color uh, uh, in the spectrum is the simulated color of that particular frame. You will see there is different spectra. Some of them are unimodal, some of them are bimodal, some of them have three peaks uh, centered at different, uh, at different uh, wavelengths, and all of them de express in different colors. What we perceive with our eyes is uh, the time average of, uh, of course, uh, there's uh, this different uh, spectra would fluctuate uh, over the time scale of a fraction of a picosecond. And uh, we, uh, we, our senses, our brain, have the time uh, to average over, uh, over uh, 10 to the 12 or 10 to the, yeah, 10 to the 12 uh, frames. And what uh, we see, what we perceive is uh, the what happens here? No, no. Doesn't work. It is blocked. Let us just start it again. Maybe it's enough. No, 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 ma mi serve quello prima, scusi. No, voglio vedere questo. No, è la stessa, è un altro, un altro build della stessa. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I will describe what is missing. What is missing is the average spectrum of. Uh, I showed I showed you all the frames that are different from each other and uh, and. Uh, uh, Let's try again. No, now it's better because the second movie also shows that previously didn't. Okay. Okay. So this is the average spectrum that is uh, different uh, from uh, all uh, the previous uh, uh, ones. And uh, uh, it's broad, and it expresses the average color that uh, we perceive. So you should have noticed, probably you have, probably you haven't, the time scale uh, on the y-axis uh, of, uh, of the movies 
uh, with uh, the fluctuation uh, of uh, the internal molecular degrees of freedom, and uh, that time scale uh, was uh, 10 picoseconds. So the movie that uh, I showed you lasts uh, uh, 10 picoseconds. What happens uh, over long time scales? So these, the movie that I showed uh, uh, was produced with uh, ab initio molecular dynamics, which is something that we can afford uh, for such short uh, time scales. If we want uh, to, uh, to do longer, possibly much longer simulations, we have uh, uh, to give up our glory dreams uh, of doing everything uh, quantum mechanically. And uh, uh, just for the sake of seeing what may happen, we run a classical molecular dynamics uh, uh, simulation. And here, uh, I, uh, I have uh, depicted two degrees of freedom that are those two dihedral angles that uh, I wish you can uh, distinguish on the screen. I'm not sure I could. But on the right, uh, we, we have uh, a green dihedral angle uh, between, uh, between uh, uh, the, uh, the flavillium, uh, the flavillium uh, uh, backbone and the sugar on the right. And the other is a different, uh, is a different uh, dihedral angle. Let's see what happens by running an MD, a classical MD simulation. The dihedral angles stay around some fixed value, and once in a while, they jump from a value to another that is totally different. Notice that the, the time scale here is, I cannot say, but it is thousands of picoseconds. So the residence time of the molecule in given free energy basins that are characterized by uh, like values of these uh, slow uh, molecular degrees of freedom are of the order of, uh, in this case, hundreds of picoseconds. How long will it take? Well, it depends, of course, on the barrier that, uh, uh, that the molecule have to overcome to switch from one likely value of dihedral angle uh, to the next. And you cannot tell in advance. Whereas uh, the, the typical time scale of the previous movie is uh, universal, because it is given by uh, the, the strength of the interatomic constants. So it is universal that is uh, a fraction of a picosecond. Here it depends on the height of the barrier to be overcome thermically. And it is an activated process. And you cannot tell how long it takes. It, 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 it can take uh, uh, nanoseconds, microseconds, days, um, years. You, it depends just on the height. Okay. So as, uh, as I was uh, saying, what we actually perceive uh, with our eyes is uh, the time average of the spectra over, uh, over times uh, that are compatible with our senses, I would say over microseconds or fractions of seconds. And basically, we can break, we can break this uh, time average. Of course, uh, if uh, important events, such as uh, these uh, switches of internal degrees of freedom, happen or occur only very rarely, you have to devise ways of simulating them uh, with uh, uh, the computer resources that you have. To this uh, purpose, I break this, uh, av this time averages into two pieces. A piece uh, that uh, uh, is going uh, to, uh, 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 to correspond to the fast atomic scale fluctuations within a same free energy basin characterized by uh, like values of uh, slow variables. That is, uh, this, uh, do you have a stick? Uh, abbiamo un puntatore manuale, tipo. No, okay. I'll do this with my finger. Okay. So I break this uh, long time average into short time averages that are meant to be effective within single free energy basins. And then the time average corresponding 
to different free energy basins is made by averaging over those free energy basins. So uh, I have first to average this trajectory, and then I have to know the relative weight of uh, different free energy basins. So basically, I have to, uh, to weight these uh, two averages with the relative weight of those uh, two pieces of the histogram. How do we do this? Well, we, uh, we first estimate uh, conformational uh, populations from very long classical molecular dynamics uh, uh, simulations, as I was uh, uh, indicating before. And uh, what we do? Basically, we, do, uh, we gather, we collect uh, statistics for each uh, important uh, slow internal degree uh, of freedom. And uh, of course, you have different uh, internal degrees of freedom uh, to be considered uh, simultaneously. The difficulty here is that uh, the, the probability distribution of different degrees of freedom are not independent of each other. You see here, according to the value of uh, one, uh, uh, of one, uh, uh, of one variable, the distribution of the other may be different. So it takes uh, some ingenuity in order to account uh, for this uh, correlation and uh, Basically, what you do uh, intuitively is you collect uh, the distribution of different, uh, of different uh, uh, internal degrees of freedom, and you tell and you and you start enumerating. For instance, one uh, one uh, conformation would be characterized by these degrees of freedom to be in uh, in this uh, in this uh, uh, region rather than that or that degree of freedom to be in this region rather than that, and so forth and so on. So by just assigning values in the histogram to each relevant degree of freedom, you identify a cluster, a geometrical conformation, and you, do, and you gather statistics. So the relative probability of being in, in one or the other conformation is the relative weight of, uh, of this histogram, and the statistical mechanics says that this relative weight is equal to the ratio of the resident times. So the, long, the, the larger is the weight of a, com, of a conformer, of a molecular conformer, the longer is the time that the molecule spends in that particular conformer. This is easily done by uh, visual inspection in a simple system like uh, uh, cyanin that has a uh, uh, few degrees of freedom. If you have uh, complicated systems as uh, we aim at, in, uh, uh, with this I will show you uh, at the end a few molecular uh, models of uh, co-pigmented uh, uh, anthocyanins that, are, that have very many internal degree of freedom. You would need a more professional approach and, uh, uh, in order to classify all these uh, clusters. And uh, this is uh, uh, the method by Alessandro uh, Laio that uh, we are presently using. Then uh, uh, this so far is uh, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Uh, this is uh, uh, so far the me the method lends itself uh, to be usable using classical force fields, but we know that classical force fields is not uh, the ultimate accuracy that, uh, that uh, we can have. Actually, we would like to obtain the same, uh, to achieve the, the same goal with quantum mechanical accuracy. Uh, how do we do this? We use uh, uh, thermodynamic perturbation theory uh, that goes more or less uh, as follows. Uh, the uh, population of a given cluster, of a given molecular conformer, is the exponential of, of the negative of the free energy. Actually, that is the definition of the free energy, uh, if you wish. And uh, if uh, you do perturbation theory, which uh, I won't uh, do here, but uh, this is uh, uh, fairly standard in statistical mechanics, 
You see that you know that if you have different Hamiltonians, uh, different force fields, the, uh, the, uh, to, to first order in the difference uh, of the force fields, the difference uh, in uh, uh, the free energies is equal to the, aver to the expectation value of the difference uh, of uh, uh, the internal energies uh, that you can compute, uh, 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 that you can uh, uh, estimate by uh, uh, molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo, if so you wish. So basically, what we do, we run uh, a, a classical simulation. We estimate on the fly along, uh, along the classical simulation for each conformer the uh, quantum mechanical energy of uh, selected snapshots, of selected uh, uh, frames along, along, the, uh, along the trajectory. We estimate uh, the internal energy difference of uh, 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 the quantum mechanical calculation minus the force field and the relative populations are corrected by the exponential of the difference of the energies thus computed. This is what we get in the case of signing. We start from a distribution of probabilities for conformers after the quantum treatment just one main conformer would, would survive. That is good news for our computer budget in this specific simple cases, case when we will deal with more complicated systems that, that I will report on next year if you invite me again. We will, we will need a, a slightly more complicated procedure. So the next step, now we have a classification of conformers according to their relative probability. We have the ability of sampling quantum mechanically internally within each, each conformer. So that for each conformer, we, uh, we run uh, 10, 20 picosecond ab initio molecular dynamics uh, runs, and uh, for each uh, of those, uh, uh, for, uh, not for each, uh, for each frame, but uh, regularly for, uh, uh, for a selection of frames uh, in each uh, uh, CPMD trajectory, we compute, uh, we compute the spectra with uh, time-dependent density functional theory, and uh, a model and a solvation model uh, that we use in this case only for spectroscopy uh, that is uh, very much uh, like uh, the PCM you are, uh, uh, you are familiar with. This is a variant of uh, the PCM that is uh, uh, more suited uh, for uh, uh, periodic calculations that, uh, that we use with uh, uh, plane waves, but basically you have uh, uh, you have a cavity, you put, uh, you put uh, your, uh, your molecule in a cavity with a different uh, directory screening uh, inside and outside. The, the key feature of uh, this method uh, that uh, I, I think uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is a good one is that the shape of, uh, of, the, of the cavity is adjusted self-consistently by the model itself according to the value of, uh, uh, of the computed electronic charge density distribution. So when the electronic charge density distribution is larger than a certain threshold, you set one value of, uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the dielectric constant. When it is uh, smaller than a certain threshold, you set uh, a different value of the dielectric constant, and this is uh, adjusted self-consistently, automatically in the algorithm without the need of designing explicitly uh, uh, the shape uh, of the cavity. So this is uh, a benchmark of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, this uh, method along uh, a first principle MD simulation. We have computed uh, uh, the molecular spectra, five minutes, the molecular spectra using uh, uh, explicit uh, water molecules, so including waters uh, in, uh, in the quantum mechanical treatment of uh, the system. 
we wash out the, uh, the, uh, the waters and replace it with the implicit solvent, and you see that we have dramatic changes. For some frames, the spectra is similar. For some other, it is uh, totally different. It is uh, um, unimodal rather than bimodal. Even when it stays unimodal, uh, the, uh, the position of the, of the maximum may, may change a little bit. But out of magic, when you average all of them, if you, if you perform the average for the explicit model and for the implicit model, the average spectra that uh, you get with the implicit model are very much like those that you would obtain with the explicit model at uh, a much, at a much uh, uh, smaller cost. Uh, this, is, uh, 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 this can be... Uh, made even uh, uh, faster with, uh, with a trick that uh, I will not uh, talk about. Otherwise, I won't have time to present uh, a few results that I think are nice. Okay, the, the, final, the final step uh, of, uh, uh, of the protocol that uh, was uh, anticipated, uh, that I anticipated many times, is that uh, once we have the ability of computing uh, the spectra on the fly over an ab initio molecular dynamics trajectory, we first average over the AIMD trajectory and then we uh, average uh, um, uh, over the different trajectories that are generated for different conformers. So this is uh, the result uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of this uh, procedure for, uh, uh, for uh, signing in solution. Uh, the color of uh, the lines uh, is, uh, uh, is an estimate of uh, the uh, simulated color of the solution in water. You see that going from uh, uh, the gas phase spectrum computed at uh, the gas phase minimum, uh, uh, energy minimum of the system going to the uh, PCM at the minimum energy, you have a shift, but the shift is much more dramatic if you include the full, the full complexity of the dynamical effects due to thermal fluctuations. So here is a very fast, a very fast glimpse of uh, of uh, the results that we got for uh, uh, signing for different uh, 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 acidities, as, uh, as uh, I, uh, I, I mentioned before, at, uh, at uh, a very uh, low uh, at very low pH, we have uh, basically only the flavillium ca uh, cation by increasing the acidity, uh, things uh, become uh, more complicated because you have uh, the coexistence uh, of uh, different uh, uh, charge state whose, uh, uh, whose relative uh, uh, concentration is, uh, 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 is measured by the um, deprotonation pKa that we are not able, we are not yet able uh, to uh, uh, compute, but we are on the way of it. And uh, basically what, uh, what is important is that at very low pH uh, we know what, uh, uh, what the molecular uh, 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 structure is. We have basically just uh, one, uh, one uh, uh, molecular species, species uh, that is the flavillium uh, cation. And in this case uh, the uh, simulation matches very nicely with uh, the measured uh, spectrum. By increasing uh, uh, the pH, we, we go over this uh, uh, transparent, uh, transparent uh, species, and uh, uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, uh, evaluate the relative concentration of different, uh, of different, uh, uh, of different uh, uh, molecular charge states, by, but by taking it 
by taking the relative concentration of these two species from experiment, again, we find a very good agreement with, with experiment. By further increasing the, uh, uh, the acidity, the, uh, the, uh, the charge state of the molecule goes from positive to neutral uh, to negative. The negative species has uh, two tautomers that have very different uh, uh, spectra according, uh, uh, according uh, to the location of the proton uh, being uh, detached. And uh, you see that here in this case uh, we have not even attempted to, uh, to convolute the spectra to compare with experiment, but you see that you have uh, remnants of this bimodal behavior of the spectrum in, in, the, uh, in the major spectra and uh, the, uh, uh, the less acidic, uh, uh, the more basic uh, is uh, the, uh, the solution, uh, the more bimodal uh, is, uh, is uh, the behavior. So uh, what next? Uh, we want, uh, we want to, uh, to address really interesting uh, uh, problems of systems that uh, due to their, oh, I'm done, uh, to their uh, uh, chemical and geometrical complexity are really hard uh, to simulate. We, are we have just started to do uh, this when, uh, when uh, the, uh, uh, the signing is functionalized with, uh, f with additional sugars uh, or uh, acyl groups. And uh, again, uh, if you want to hear about that, uh, please uh, have me back uh, uh, next year. This is what uh, I wanted to say. Uh, just, uh, uh, let me just run through the names uh, of uh, the youth uh, that are helping me. Uh, actually, I'm not that they, they are helping me, that uh, they are doing uh, uh, all the work. Marco and uh, Marta are postdoc uh, at CISA. Uh, they are involved uh, in uh, the more uh, phenomenological and uh, statistical mechanics uh, uh, part of, uh, of uh, uh, this work. Uh, Yuri uh, has been a postdoc uh, with us for three years. Uh, he's going to leave uh, to uh, Lausanne pretty soon. He's uh, responsible for uh, 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 most of the methodological developments that uh, I've uh, uh, told you about. Xiao Chuan Ge is uh, a former PhD student at CISA, now at uh, Brookhaven, uh, who started uh, this work. Alessandro Laio, you all uh, know him. Uh, he's uh, the guru of this uh, free energy uh, stuff. Arrigo is a CNR uh, research fellow who actually introduced me uh, to this field. Thank uh, to all of you for having me with you today, and uh, thank you again. Thank you very much for the very nice uh, lecture. Now the session is open for questions. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It, uh, the flowchart of your presentation was very nice. But I am I'm a little bit lost when you showed the clustering stuff because when you did the simulations, you observed that there are actually two different confirmations which are highly populating. But later when you show the different clusters, there were four or five more clusters. I, I, didn't, I was lost at that point. How did you categorize okay, this? Okay. Uh, thank you for, uh, for bringing this up. Uh, I think uh, there are, uh, the answer to your question has two, goes in two steps. So uh, we have more for two different reasons. The first, you could have more even if you had the just one slow variable. Suppose you have just one angle and, uh, uh, and there is no reason why there should be just two metastable configurations, right? You may have two, you may have three, you may have many even with just one variable, just one variable. But then you have many variables. So the number, suppose you have, uh, okay, you, have, you may have many for one variable, but suppose you have just a two for one variable and you have many variables. What is the number of confirmations? 
is 2 to the power the number of variables, right? Because uh, you can, for each variable, you can, pull, you can put a ball into two drawers, and the total number of combinations of conformers is 2 to the number of drawers. Does this answer your question? Some simulations on protein systems like that. So you have this uh, any ready-made code that we can test, especially this the fast search uh, methodology that you. It's being used. It's being used. I, I think you better you better contact Alessandra. I'm not sure that there is a ready-to-use code. There is a ready-to-use algorithm, and it's being used for many different reasons and for many different, uh, he's doing um, um, taxonomy and classification uh, of um, electroencephalodiagrams and uh, many different things. <laughs> you can classify, can make face recognition. Basically what you need to, uh, to use that as well as any as any uh, categorization uh, uh, algorithm is you have to establish a metric in your configuration space and you have to have a measure of how far or how close two configurations are. Once you have this, you can feed the metric and your database of results into the algorithm. That is pretty easy. The algorithm itself it doesn't take uh, years of coding. So thank you for the nice presentation. Um, so basically, you're applying all the classical Franconian principle uh, to obtain the spectra. And uh, what people usually do no, is to run dynamics with the classical force field, and then they have a number of snapshots, and then they have the spectra. Uh, you're doing something that is more accurate because you are using uh, ab initio dynamics. Uh, but since you did both, no, because you were also doing classical, using classical force field to sample the different conformations. So my question is, uh, an additional error one has when one does a classical approximation is that if you do not use the same force field that then you are using for the calculation of the transition, you maybe you are not sampling the right distribution around the equilibrium geometry in the sense that the equilibrium geometry of the classical force field is different from the equilibrium geometry of the ab initio. So since you have both, did you, did you test uh, if this additional error that you do not have, but other people have, if it has an impact, and which impact it has? Uh, the short answer is no. We didn't uh, uh, test anything in this. Uh, the little, the more elaborate answer is that we know by experience, I, I don't have numbers to quote, but we know uh, that at least the relative weight of different conformers is changed by this quantum mechanical correction. This is different from what you were asking. You were asking what, what about uh, the dynamics within each conformer. And, uh, uh, I don't have, uh, I don't have uh, an answer to, uh, for this. Okay, so if there are no other questions, let's uh, thank again Stefan Brown. <laughs> and uh, we can uh, move on with the next speaker, Cristiana Di Valentin from the University of uh, Milano Bicocca. She will speak about the charge carriers separation at graphene titania interface. Please. Grazie. 
mattina fuori e questo è il collo dove conviene metterlo? qui no. però non c'è la presentazione Good morning, good morning, do you hear me? Ok, but I still don't have the presentation. Ah ok, so how do you do? Ok, ok. Ok, good morning to everybody. Let me first thank the organizers and Vincenzo in particular for giving me the opportunity to be here with you and to present my, my work. So, um, uh, actually I feel the weight of history a little bit <laughs> and coming from a modern university like uh, our University of Milano Bicocca, it reminds me very much of my early times at the University of Pavia, which looks uh, very much like uh, this one. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, let's start with the scientific uh, talk. So, until recent times, putting uh, graphene and chemical reactivity in the same sentence was truly an oxymoron uh, um, due to the inertness of, of this material. However, uh, in 2000 and and in 12, we have uh, proposed a project entitled Beyond Graphene, Taylor Carbon Layers for Novel Catalytic uh, Materials and Green Chemistry, where we propose that Taylor modification of graphene uh, could induce, could trigger uh, chemical, unexpected chemical reactivity, boosting the application of graphene in a variety of fields such as catalysis, electrocatalysis, and photocatalysis. So uh, now we, uh, this project has then been granted, and now we have uh, some uh, interesting and successful results together with the experimental groups in Padova, uh, Trieste, and Genoa. So how can you induce reactivity in graphene? Essentially, we have investigated two approaches. One is by doping graphene with non-metal elements, and the other approach is interfacing graphene with other donor or acceptor uh, materials. Reactivity by doping um, was shown to uh, improve uh, kinetics and thermodynamics of catalytic processes. For example, here I show you the case sorry, of, oops, I'm going too far. <laughs> sorry, I touched something. Can we go back? Okay, we do can. So, um, uh, boron dope graphene, for example, you see, has been shown to improve uh, catalytic processes by lowering activation barriers or in inducing, uh, uh, improving the th thermodynamics from endothermic to exothermic. And also, it has been used, for example, bo again, boron dope graphene as electrocatalytic uh, material um, in uh, fuel cells for oxygen reduction reaction, so RR or hydrogen evolution reaction, uh, reaction HER. Reactivity by interfacing graphene. Uh, in this case, we, can, we have examples of graphene interfaced with methyls. And here, the, the catalysis in, is improved, especially when the molecules can effectively intercalate into the interface between the two materials. And this is shown to be due to the confinement effect, which allows to lower the activation barriers and improve their activity. It is also called catalysis undercover. Uh, the other uh, possibility is to interface graphene with semiconductors. And this is a developing approach in photocatalysis and in photovoltaics. What uh, people observe is a fast uh, electron transfer between the, uh, from one material to the other, which uh, improves the electron hole separation and does the performance, uh, again, of the nanocomposites uh, materials. 
recently very charming and attractive system have been prepared like those I'm showing you. Here we have some semiconducting oxide which are completely wrapped up by graphene. So the topic of today's talk is focused and I will show you essentially the interface between graphene and uh, titanium dioxide, being this the most popular photocatalyst and also being titanium dioxide material which is used in uh, photovoltaics in disensitized solar cells, for example. So let me briefly mention something about the two uh, fields. So photocatalysis is a uh, redox, pro redox process which takes place at the surface of the material and is induced by light uh, which um, separates an electron and a hole, they may travel into the bulk and reach the surface where the redox processes take place, or in the bad cases, they re just recombine, producing uh, an emi an emission, a radiative emission. In the disensitized solar cell, the excitation takes place in the dye, and then the excited electron may be injected into the conduction band of titanium dioxide. So this just to have some common uh, reference point where to start. So why are we interested into the titania graphene interface and with respect to these two applications? Here uh, we can comment a little bit on this scheme. Essentially, when the titanium dioxide graphene interface is used in photocatalysis, really the pointer seems not to be working. So we have this on the left. We have essentially nanoparticles of titanium dioxide which are supported by a graphene sheet. The excitation is done by UV light and electrons go from the valence band of titania to the conduction band of uh, of titania. And what is interesting in these systems is that the Fermi level of graphene is below the bottom of the conduction band, so electrons are easily transferred, and once they are in graphene, they just travel very quickly because of the conductivity of graphene. In photovoltaics, the situation is very different because here, essentially, graphene uh, is put in the form of quantum dots on a titania surface, so you see it's a little bit reversed. And here, the, the quantum dots of graphene act as a, a sensitizer, so play the same role of the dyes in the dye-sensitized solar cell. So the quantum dots absorb a sensitizer for visible light, and then the electron, which is excited, can go into the conduction band of titania. So the outline of the talk, uh, briefly some computational details, and then we, we start with the interface in the ground state. We look at structural electronic properties. When we, we will put some oxygen underneath, so in the, in the interface, and finally we will investigate the excited state of this uh, interface. There are many open questions, of course, because I show you these simplified schemes, but of course there are many open questions. Uh, already at the level of type of interaction between the two materials, is it really only governed by weak interaction? or there is some net charge transfer between the two materials which induces electron, elect, electrostatic attraction. Is there any chemical, truly chemical bond or not? Uh, how strong is the interaction? Can we tune the interaction by chemical modification or not? And on the respect of excitation, what is the minimum energy re radiation to excite this hybrid system? Sorry? Five minutes. No, I'm sorry, I just, I, it's not possible. I just started, I'm not even, I, I tried it at home, I'm sure it's not possible. I, I, this is only the introduction. I know, but, no, it's, no, I don't think so, it's not possible. Anyway, let me go, yes, of course. So there are many open questions as I showed you. I don't, I don't, I'm sorry I didn't check, but I'm sure I cannot be talked. I haven't talked for 10 minutes already. So these are the models I, uh, we use. We use both molecular and periodic models, depending on the specific problem. And the codes you, you can see here, uh, so I will skip a little bit here the details. In the case of this interface, 
We have used the periodic approach, of course, and we have interfaced anatase because it's the most stable phase of titania, and the 101 surface because it's the most stable surface of anatase. And here I show you the fully relaxed structure for this interface system as obtained with the HSC06 model together with the Grimme correction for the weak interactions. Uh, you see the, from the side view that the distance between the two materials is about 2.8 um, and uh, there is no chemical bond form, although we have tried to, to make some bridging bonds between the two materials. We have compared different methods and it is clear that the, the correction uh, for the weak interaction is, is a crucial issue to, to, to describe the dist correct distance and the absorption energy. Now we go to an electronic structure, and here another crucial point is the description of the band gap of titania. So if you, you describe it with a semi-local functional, you will have an uh, underestimated band gap, and then there will be a resulting charge transfer from graphene, top of valence band, to titania, bottom of conduction band, which is, however, spurious, because if you do the same calculation with a hybrid functional, which uh, reasonably reproduces the, the gap of titania, then you see that there is no charge transfer. So the Fermi level is exactly at the top of the valence band of graphene and below the bottom of the conduction band of titania. This is more clear here. This is the model we have used. OK, so here. I, I, as I mentioned, we looked at the oxygen at the interface because there are many reasons why you could have oxygen at the interface due to how you, this system are prepared, but I will not enter into these details. And what we found, we found a, a stable structure. Uh, essentially, uh, there is a bridging oxygen between an undercoordinated titania and carbon from the graphene. And the binding energy, of course, becomes much higher. And also, there is a state hybridization once you have the oxygen in between, which should favor the electron transfer from one material to the other. Last part of the talk. So here we, we discussed the photoexcited system. So let me first remind you about some previous result we obtained a few years ago for the pristine surface. So if you add an extra excited electron into uh, anatase, a slab model, you see that the extra electron is essentially trapped at a subsurface titanium site. Of course, we have investigated more possibilities. This is the best trapping site, and there is an associated state below the uh, bottom of the conduction band. If you have an extra hole, uh, you see that the hole will be trapped at the bridging oxygen on the surface, and this is the associated empty state. So what is this trapping? This trapping is due to the polaronic distortion around the trapping site, so some kind of elongation of the bonds uh, around the trapping site for the titanium free plus and also uh, near the O minus uh, all trapping site. And this is described, again, only if you use some methods which correct for the self-interaction problem. So if you use a semi-local functional, again, you won't see the trapping, but you will just see uh, the localized band states. And this is not in agreement with experiments, and I don't have time, but there are many experiments by infrared or EPR that show the nature of these uh, uh, trap states uh, and, and can prove that actually uh, electrons and holes are, are trapped in titanium. So I will skip that. And now we look at the interface. What happens when we have graphene over anatase? So here you see that if you have an extra electron, it will ex exactly go on the same titanium free plus. There will be some uh, extra electron also around a little bit, but essentially the most of it will be on the same titanium free plus. When you put an extra hole in the system, this will be fully delocalized in the graphene sheet. So what does that mean? That the two the photoexcited electron and hole have different preferences. So the hole prefers to stay in the graphene sheet and the electron prefers to be trapped in titania. So, so this different spontaneous tendency of the two to go into the different materials is very important for the applications because it will reduce the recombination rate between them. Okay, I think I will, will not talk about the exit. Huh? 
although it would be very interesting with, in this community. Maybe you will ask me <laughs> in the questions, uh, because we also studied the exciton for both, both Titania and the interface Titania uh, graphene uh, with this scheme where we compare total energies. And we obtain vertical self-trapping of the exciton and photoluminescence energies. And you see there are some results we obtain. So since I'm running out of time, no conclusions, uh, I will just put them on the screen. Let me thank the people. This is my group, and this is the person with whom we mainly collaborate in Padua, and the funding. And also, let me do some advertisement, if there is anybody interested in a postdoc. I have, uh, I'm going to start my ESC project in February, and I'm looking for a very good and excited and interested postdocs. So please contact me. So I'll go back to conclusion. So if you have any questions. I have to run. Okay. Thank you very much also for the speed up at the end. I'm now sorry. you are ready you. for some questions. Any questions? I have one about the exit. So oh, thank tell you. Me about no, it. You're very kind. <laughs> okay. But now I don't see the presentation anymore. Can we put the presentation back? Okay. So. So the existence of self-trap exitons. Uh, in Titania is uh, proven by, uh, by the stock shift in the, in the luminescence spectrum, from, so the stock shift from the absorption band. So it is known that there are triplet self-trap excitons in Titania, and this is the experimental, and the assignment is, uh, is that this is due to the radiative recombination of electron in holes. So we, we tried to, to simulate this. How do you treat the excitons? So it's a very simplified approach that we have used. Um, we, we first used in 2011 in, uh, for bare, um, for pristine uh, titania. So what we do, I can show you later. I have uh, some additional slides. So the crown state, we consider the singlet. The excited state, we consider as the triplet. Why? Because in their own spin configuration, these are two ground states. And so we can use DFT and do total energy calculations. So it's, of course, if you look at the excitation, this is a forbidden excitation. But then we are interested in the trapping energy of the exciton, and this is reasonable. And then we are interested in the uh, emission and the triplet. Uh, is, this is a triplet uh, exciton, and so it's correct. Uh, as for regards to emission. So the only problem would be in really considering the absorption energy in this approach. So it's a simplified approach uh, with uh, total energy calculations. But as you see, the emission is 2.6, which is very close to, to, to what is experimentally observed. Okay, thank you. So once you have excited in the triplet state, Titania, then you do some rela atomic relaxation, and you see that this is trapped into local, uh, local sites. So it depends if it's a bulk. I, I have the bulk here. In the bulk, you see you will have uh, the electron in the titanium, 3 plus, and the, and the hole in the nearby oxygen. So they are really very close one to the other. Okay. So it's not the, uh, the binding energy of exciton. This, this is not. This is just the trapping energy. So the, the, distort, the um, atomic relaxation associated with the trapping of the exciton. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation to come. It's always a pleasure to come to Pisa. And remembering the first time I came into this room, which was about the mid-70s, uh, and I decided that I should give a brief introduction to my talk in Italian, which I duly wrote out and memorized and everything else. It was a complete and utter disaster, so I will not repeat it again. Uh, 
I can understand Italian, but to hear me speak, I, you need a half a bottle of whiskey down me before I can do it. So I've seen that every, what's on everybody... It would be a good idea, yes, yes. My Italian definitely improves the more I've drunk. I've also noticed that people have had, been having trouble with movies, uh, so I thought I would begin with an introduction to my talk with a movie, if I can make it work. Oh. Is it working? Yes. So my talk is actually about uh, electron dynamics, and this is a picture of electron dynamics uh, in, a, in a fictitious molecule. Uh, if you create uh, an electronic state that's a superposition, that's not a stationary state, uh, then um, the wave function will evolve, and the, that motion is electron dynamics. This is simulating the creation of, the, of an ionization of one of the double bonds in this, in this picture. Uh, it creates a, a, su a sudden excitation, creates a superposition of two, of two states, and th that's a picture of the spin density that evolves with time. And what I'm going to talk about is mainly the results of a collaboration with our physics department, who are doing attosecond spectroscopy. In other words, they would be starting experimentally to look at processes uh, that are shorter than one femtosecond. And that brings into being the world of electron dynamics and the coupling with the nuclei, uh, which is what we've been doing as one, as one project for the last couple of years. So, nobody showed me how to use this. Ah, it's all right. Remember, which one? Okay, okay, good. So first of all, um, let me introduce the people who did all the hard work. Uh, Morgan Wacher is from Paris. She's doing a PhD with us in the moment. At the moment, Jan Meisner was a summer student from Stuttgart who did some of the uh, work that I'm talking about. Mike Bearpark is my colleague, and Andrew Jenkins is from Wales, so the only two of us from England, uh, all the rest are from either other parts of the United Kingdom or the, or the other parts of Europe. Uh, so let me try and explain what the talk is about, and this is uh, perhaps the easiest slide for me to do that with. There's a picture of a conical intersection on that picture, and then below it, uh, are white and black regions of the surface which represent the mixture of two possible diabetic states that correspond to ionization from either one end of the molecule or, a, or another. Uh, I don't have a pointer, but if you look at the red arrow, uh, if I have that wave function and, uh, and it was a wave function at the conical intersection, then you know that if you um, transform it into de degenerate states, and then any degenerate state is also a stationary state at that, at that point. But if you displace yourself from the conical intersection, um, then of course you have to solve the Schrodinger equation for a stationary state. I mean, if you assume an arbitrary superposition, it's a non-stationary state, and you will see the evolution of the wave function with time as a solution to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So in the electron dynamics that I just showed you on the first slide, uh, what we did was ionize effectively just from one end of the molecule and not, and not from the other one. The actual eigenfunction was a linear superposition of the two, so that wave function evolved in time, and if you plot the spin density as a function of time, you see that time oscillation in the spin density taking place with a period of around, of around seven femtoseconds. So the $64 million question, or whatever it is, is can you actually do experiments that um, can uh, measure such dynamics or detect them, and perhaps even from a more important point of view from, from our perspective, is if I can design at a second pulses, uh, can I do chemistry or can I at least do molecular sciences, molecular science with uh, non-stationary states where I've got electron dynamics taking place driving the chemical reaction. That then means that I have to couple the nuclei in some way uh, and see, see if I can observe, not necessarily atochemistry, but at least molecular science at the atosecond time scale. Um, so I'll start 
continue a little bit just with this toy example, so perhaps, the, perhaps you get the, the idea. Uh, the solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for, um, two, for a two-level system is written at the top of the slide. It's associated with energies. Uh, E1 and E2, and weights Z1 and Z2. If you square that and take, and take the probability, then you're going to see oscillations in the, in the density, and the oscillations in the density will occur if both states are populated. In other words, both Z1 and Z2 are non-zero, and the period of the oscillation will depend upon the um, energy difference between the, between the two states. I've only got the variable t in there because, again, at the moment, I'm just assuming the nuclei are fixed in space. So that first plot I showed you, I don't allow the nuclei to move. I'm taking a real physicist's approach. Nuclei are clamped in space and looking at the behavior of the electronic wave function as a function of time. So this is just snapshots from that movie that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, and it shows that the half period of oscillation is about 7.5 femtoseconds. And this is the result of doing an initial ionization to a, a diabatic state, which is a non-stationary state, which will evolve in time. And so that's the movie I showed you. I won't bother to show you again, because I probably couldn't get it to work again. Um, so let me now come to what the, the crux of the matter is, and that is that the electrons are the nuclei are not clamped in space. We have to consider nuclear effects, and and what we're then going to be concerned with is what happens to the nuclei in a field that is created by electrons in a non-stationary state, or if you like, how do the nuclei couple to this electron dyna dynamics? Can they be approximately synchronous, or what, or what have you? And there are two problems. Uh, Again, I wish I had a pointer. I'm trying to show you the at the top of the slide is uh, the slopes of two potential energy surfaces in the region of a conical intersection. And if you, if you see that uh, if you move along um, in that gray area and you change the geometry, then you change the gaps between the two surfaces. So remember that the electron dynamics depended upon the energy gap. So if I start changing the gap as the nuclei are moved, then will it all just go away and become, become random? So that's the first problem. What's the nature? How does the coupled nuclear motion affect the electron dynamics? Uh, and secondly, as we heard in a couple of talks already this morning, uh, the nuclei are not clamped in space even at absolute zero. Uh, there's a distribution or a spatial delocalization of the nuclei. So if I'm ionizing a neutral species, uh, then I've got a distribution of geometries that I'm ionizing from. Or if you like, the initial wave packet, the initial, initial nuclear wave packet has a spread. That will again change those energy gaps. And so will that wonderful electron dynamics just be all washed out and, and gone? Or will I be able to see something? Those are the types of questions that, we, that we're asking. So what's the motivation behind it all? I mentioned we're collaborating with our atrosecond physicists uh, across the other side of the, of the campus. And in principle, the experiments are such now that one should be able to observe pure electron dynamics uh, if it exists. Uh, so um, the sub femtosecond barrier has been broken oh, about, about 10 years ago now. It's perfectly possible via laser ionization to create a coherent superposition of states. Controlling the composition of them and everything else is a much, much more difficult task. So one may then have pure electron dynamics of the sort that I was just talking about, and that maybe that nuclear motion won't begin to wash everything out. So one will see some pure electron dynamics. So can we see that? And then maybe close to my own heart, if we're doing pulsed attosecond spectroscopy, then can I use that to actually drive chemical reactivity? Can I change the course? of uh, a chemical reaction by electronic control. So again, this is this picture that I showed you before uh, in the region of a conical intersection, just, just so you can get the idea how you may create a non-stationary state uh, if you're close together on a conical intersection away from the apex, then the energy difference is already fairly small, and so you've got a reasonable chance of exciting a combination of those, of those two of those two states. And so most of, the most of the theoretical studies we've done have been done in this sort of region. 
Okay, so then these are the questions to be answered by our, by our calculations. How is the electron dynamics affected by nuclear motion? And there are two separate questions. One, if I couple, couple the nuclear motion in to the electron dynamics, can I still see that electron dynamics? Are the, are the changes in the slopes of the two potential energy surfaces occurring relatively slowly so that this oscillation that I see in the electron di dynamics will live long enough for it to be detectable? And then, secondly, a much more fundamental question is, will the natural spread of the initial geometries completely wash out, wash, out the, wash out the electron dynamics completely. In other words, I haven't got a fixed geometry even at the initial point. I've got a spread of geometries, and that may wipe out the coherence. And then finally, um, can I use a coherent superposition of states to control initial nuclear di dynamics? So I'll just take you through a snapshot of some of the calculations that we've done to address all of these points. It's very much work that's, that's ongoing. I'd better say something about the theory, even to this audience. Uh, we use something called Ehrenfest dynamics. Um, and the, perhaps the easiest, the two ways of thinking about it, uh, either I, I, I can imagine that I generate a superposition of states, and each state has a Gaussian, so I've got a, a weight on each one of those potential surfaces, and that's, that's the thing that my nuclei are seeing. And that's perhaps the easiest way for most people to grasp. There's another way of thinking about it that I want to come back to at the end of the talk, and that is that if I create a superposition of electronic states, I've created a new potential surface, effectively. So I've changed the shape of the potential surface. But I'll come back to that idea. And then we have to move the nuclei. And this is where the Ehrenfest approximation comes in. Uh, we move the nuclei by computing the classical force from the time-dependent wave function. Uh, and we're in the process of going beyond this now by floating Gaussians on it, but that's not sufficiently developed that I want to talk about it in public. So it's quite a bit of hard work. I don't expect you to be able to read this slide or anything else. Let me just give you the elements of what goes into the theory. We're effectively using a CI formalism within, within the, uh, within the, within the idea of CAS SCF. So I've got the, my time-dependent wave function is a superposition of CAS SCF states. It, I propagate that uh, as a solution to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And then I have to compute the gradient under which the nuclei move. And that's the sticky bit because I've got a non-stationary state. So all the nice simple formula that one has for the gradients in standard quantum chemistry go out the window because there are a whole lot of other terms that you have to add to it. Uh, so the gradient has several extra terms. And the second derivative is, is just a nightmare. But that's all done and programmed. And you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and that's one of the reasons for using Ehrenfest in that we can have an expression for both the gradient and the second derivative so we can do the propagation of the, of the nuclei fairly efficiently. Uh, I guess you can look at it sideways. I don't know how it went in si sideways. My apology. If you just turn your head sideways, that's the error in the energy as a function of time. Um, the dotted curve is if I just use the gradient. If I use the gradient and the Hessian, it gets a bit better. But in fact, I have to combine it with a bit of numerical integration on, of the equations due to Bernie Schlegel. And you can see I'm running, a, I'm running a trajectory for about 50 femtoseconds without any error. And so you know in this sort of work when you've got your codes right um, because the, the error that you accumulate in the dynamics goes away. OK, so to the first question. How is the electron dynamics affected by nuclear motion? Um, so the example I'm going to use here is phenylethylamine. God, I got, I got the name right. Uh, and it's related to experiments that occur in the, in the literature on phenylaniline, but I just, just tried to simplify it a little bit. There are two structures there. One is the structure of the Frank Condon region, and the other one is the structure of the surface crossing. And you can see that they're fairly close so we're near to a conical intersection. What occurs in the experiment is you either get ionization from the benzene or ionization from the nitrogen. Uh, and what you see is then charge oscillation taking place uh, in time between the nitrogen and the phenyl ring. So it's like the first example I gave you. There are two, there are two um, points where the point charge can, 
can reside. Uh, we have to be able to follow the electrons, the, the, um, the, the, the electron dynamics in some, some fashion, and we do that by computing the spin density. It's easier than, to, than defining the charge density, uh, and the results are more or less the same. So we have to compute the spin density at every point, and then what we what we see uh, if we plot the spin density as a function of time, first of all with the nuclei clamped in space, maybe this picture is a bit hard to appreciate, I'm ionizing this time from the nitrogen, that's the red curve, and then I've shown some pictures of the spin density on the fennel ring just in two positions, and you can see that I'm moving the charge from the nitrogen to the fennel ring and back again with a period of around 10 femtoseconds. So that's pure electron dynamics, started by creating a non-stationary state by ion effectively ionizing from the nitrogen atom. All right? So that's electron dynamics. This is what happens if you allow the nuclei to couple. So you put all of that apparatus in. These are the, this is the same picture, but now the nuclei are moving in concert with the, with the electron density. And you can see that for the first 10 femtoseconds or so, uh, it hasn't affected anything very much. And then you can see that the energy levels are changing, uh, the energy gaps are changing, and ultimately, a sufficiently long time, it's just, it's just going to collapse. But we've done quite a few calculations like this, and it's, it's quite encouraging. You can observe the electron dynamics for the first five or 10 femtoseconds before it all begins to fall apart with, with nuclear motion. So that appears to be good news. And this picture tries to illustrate that in, by just plotting the electron density on the nitrogen. Uh, the faint curve in the back is the pure electron dynamics, the charge going away from the nitrogen and back and away and back. And the curve underneath is the uh, when I've allowed the nuclei to move. And you can see that certainly for the first five to ten femtoseconds, uh, you can still recognize the electron dynamics there. So that's an effect that you might have thought was observable. Now the sticky one. What about the effect of the natural nuclear width? The natural spread in the zero point energy um, due to ionization from the ground state. And what, we sim what we've done is simulate that by running 500 air and fest trajectories with a Wigner sample uh, over, the, over the equilibrium geometry. And so the one of the examples we've used to illustrate it with uh, is the para-exylene radical cation. Uh, here there's a conical, there would be a conical intersection in the benzene radical and chemical substitution displaces it from the apex of the cone. So the actual geometry on a plot that goes through the various tautomeric forms of the uh, benzene radical cation, the geometry is shown here. And this is the this is the electron dynamics that takes place at that, at that geometry, starting from a wave function that's produced here. So I guess that pitch is a little bit complicated. I'm using it for two things. The structures I've shown on there are geometries, marked by double bonds and so on. They're also rumor type structures, and they represent the electronic structure. So I'll show this a couple of times. Uh, if I allow the nuclei to move, then I, I see more or less the same result that I saw before. This blue bit here is the motion of the nuclei, and it's quite close to where I started from. Um, the red bit are the, elect are the, are the movement, is the, ele is the electron dynamics, and they're more or less oscillating in the same place. And again, apologies for the confusion. I'm trying to show two things on the plot. So those structures around there represent rumor structures or electronic structures and geometries at the same time. If it's blue, it represents the geometry. If it's red, it represents the, ele the electronic structure. Uh, and so this is the picture I showed you already. So this is the result when I have um, coupled nuclear elect ele electron dynamics, both for, for xylene, and you can compare the pure electron dynamics for PLA, and again, even when you change the initial conditions, uh, it doesn't change anything very much. Unfortunately, this is the result when you run 500 trajectories and average over the uh, initial geometries. 
The top curve is for xylene, the bottom curve is for uh, PLA. You can see the faint white lines in the background are the individual electron dynamics computed at those 500 points. And the solid white curve in the middle is the, is, is the average. So you can see that you've got two limiting sit situations. In perixylene, where the curves are quite steep because you're very close to a conical intersection, you get about half a period of the electron dynamics and then it's gone. It's washed out by this effect. Uh, if you go to PLN, then what you're getting, almost, almost half an oscillation period before again it, it, begins, to get, it begins to get washed out. So, uh, if I can summarize briefly then, uh, the effect of the natural spread, the effect of the, of the spread of the nuclear motion at the equilibrium geometry is profound. Depending upon the slopes of the two curves, it may almost wash it out. So, one's got an active search now to try and discover systems that are more like the bottom curve than the top curve. So then, the final topic, which is one that is close to my heart, is can the nature of a coherent superposition of electronic states be used to control the nuclear dynamics? So I want to begin with a toy example. The, the gradient is perhaps the best way I'm going to talk about it. So in other words, if I create a superposition, then the gradient will be different. And depending upon the nature of that superposition, I can make the gradient point there or there. Yeah? So I'll show you in a I'll show you an example. So I'll start with it. Start with a toy example, um, just to just to illustrate the the problem again. In this case, using uh, the benzene radical cation and toluene. Um, this is what the potential surface looks like. Again, I've already been over that. I'm using these two structures these tautomeric forms to represent two things. Um, and so what, this is the punch line, and I hope answers the question you just asked me. So if I start right at the conical intersection and I do the nuclear, I do the nuclear dynamics driven by the Ehrenfest wave function, then I'm actually on an adiabatic surface. And so where the system moves, depends where I am on that adiabatic surface. It's just the gradient at, that, at that, that point. The second curve shows what happens if I just do an equal superposition of the ground state and the excited state and look at the electron dynamics. In this case, the wave function is not initially a stationary state because I'm not actually sitting at a conical intersection. And the most important thing is if you look at the nuclear motion it's at right angles to the one that it is, is here. So I've turned the direction of the, of the initial nuclear motion 45 degrees by, by doing a superposition of states. So now the theory behind that comes from looking at the gradient. Um, so uh, if I do a general superposition together with a complex phase, e to the i phi, then that's the expression for the gradient for a, for a two-level system. And the important point is, uh, whoops, then I have additional terms like this that I, wouldn't, that I don't get when the wave function uh, is real. So the contributions to the gradient that result from the mixing of the, of the complex states. I guess I, I haven't got a lot of time to say very much about this, except that just ask you to think about one thing. These are plots like the ones I showed you earlier of the surface in the region of a conical intersection. But the surface is plotted as a function of the complex mixing. So I've gone through the complete range of the real mixing. and That's what creates the double cone. The yellow and red is like the black and white that I had before, but this is continuous. And phi is the angle of complex mixing. And if you look at it, of course, what you're doing is by mixing the complex phase into your wave function is that you're changing the shape of the potential surface. The potential surface has gone elliptic along the along along a derivative coupling code. And so in the region of a conical intersection, 
by controlling the mixing, you can change the direction of the gradient. And, and you're seeing that with the various colors on there. If you allow a complex phase, then you stretch the potential surface along one direction, preferentially uh, the derivative coupling. And there's a picture that shows that. Oh, it's all come out backwards. What a pity. Um, that's what happens when you go from a Mac to a PC. Uh, can I make any sense out of it before I've lost it completely? I think maybe this is the one, this is the one you want to look at if you can turn your head sideways, yes? So this is mixed, the two states at 45 degrees, and what you'll see is that as I scan through the complex angle, I remain in the gradient difference coordinate. If I set the phase to be 90 degrees and scan the other angle, I can, I can produce all of the trajectories in one, in one plane. So in this toy example, if, if you like, one has extended the idea of the Berry phase of a conical intersection to the gradient. And if one extends that to the, to the gradient, you can see that you change the shape of the potential surface. So there is some possibility, I think, of, of looking at at a second control. And I think that's where I wanted to, to stop. I think I've almost made it, kept the time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And uh, there is time for questions. Fabrizio. Okay, yes, yes, okay, I've understood. Yeah, because, no, because you okay. want exactly but, but I can't, I can't. That you can change the gradient. Wait, no. I, so, if I, could I answer your first question? Because it's very simple, and then, then, then maybe, maybe we'll catch up with each other. So I want to do dynamics with the superposition of states, yes? Therefore, surface hopping doesn't, no, doesn't get into the question at all. Not that, yeah. yeah, okay. So, uh, so I, I, I've answered half the question in my talk, but not the other half. Okay, the half, the half that I've answered, I've done by sampling the zero point, the zero point and it, energy, and you've seen that yes, the coherence is is lost under certain under certain conditions, and I believe that is probably the dominant effect. But I accept the fact that I need to go beyond Ehrenfest now, and and it's, we're writing the code to do it, uh, and I need to float Gaussian wave packets on those Ehrenfest trajectories and solve the nuclear dynamics part. And it's, it's not all that easy. It's, it's a bit of work. And we, and we haven't finished it yet. But I, I know that there is that deep. But, but if the coherence is lost from the first effect, then the, then the second one isn't of any interest. So, um, Just a very simple question. So up to how many surfaces can you, can you treat in this way? I mean, just uh, two for the time being. No, no, no. All those calculations had had all of the CAS SCF states okay, in. Good. So there were um, between ten and a hundred thousand, or whatever. Or whatever. There, all all the states were there. Okay. We didn't truncate the CI. I wrote down the equations for a two-state problem because then you can look at it and see what it's like. But and in fact, um, even put even. Putting three states in, when you analyze the problem afterwards, the, de the decoherence is even faster from the spread of that, because you've not just got one pair of gradients, but you've got, you've got several. Are there any other questions? Uh, in this case, uh, let's thank again the yeah. speaker. Cristina, questa vado a te. We move on to the next speaker, who is Cristina Puzzarini from the University of Bologna, and she will talk about quantum chemistry meets spectroscopy for astrochemistry, increasing complexity toward the prebiotic uh, molecules.
<clears throat> okay, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for inviting me to give this short contribution in which uh, I would like to address the role of quantum chemical calculation in the field of uh, actually rotational spectroscopy. Doesn't work. Okay, it works. It's just low. <laughs> it works. Uh, in the field of uh, rotational spectroscopy applied to uh, astrochemistry, and the focus is here on uh, uh, prebiotic molecules. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, it's a prebiotic molecule, and uh, the reason why we are so interested in prebiotic molecule in the field of astrochemistry uh, uh, essentially is uh, um, related to the uh, origin of life theme, which is uh, very timely nowadays. Uh, I have to thank uh, Nadia, uh, from whom I took this uh, slide, because I think it's uh, uh, really... Um, perfect for addressing um, what I would like to say. And uh, essentially, we have uh, um, two possible scenarios for the uh, origin of life on Earth. Uh, the endonodules, uh, which, uh, um, oh, this is, OK, it doesn't work. Uh, OK, the, the one that uh, thinks that uh, um, life started uh, directly on Earth, so uh, biological molecules uh, were synthesized uh, directly uh, on Earth. And uh, the other scenario thinks that uh, uh, molecules were formed in the interstellar clouds and uh, then delivered uh, to, uh, to Earth. The reason why there are uh, some uh, um, uh, this uh, second scenario is uh, probably now, nowadays the uh, most suggested one is uh, that uh, some organic uh, um, molecule with some complexity uh, have been found in uh, interstellar clouds and also some prebiotic molecule like amino acid found in uh, meteorites and uh, uh, comets. Uh, so the, the question is uh, how the, um, uh, this uh, prebiotic molecule uh, were, um, were formed, and uh, this is uh, the answer that uh, uh, astrochemistry would like to answer. Uh, astrochemistry, which is a multidisciplinary uh, field uh, that involves uh, uh, radio astronomical observation, uh, different kind of experimental and computational uh, laboratory studies involving um, spectroscopy, kinetics, and so on, and uh, of course uh, involving modeling um, for explaining uh, the uh, formation routes of uh, uh, molecule in uh, uh, space. So the um, topic I would like to address is something that seems to be uh, really uh, narrow and uh, uh, limited in this uh, uh, um, uh, scenario, but it's uh, the starting point uh, because uh, the identification of uh, the spectroscopic signature um, of uh, a given molecule uh, in the emission spectra from astronomical objects essentially provides the unequivocal proof uh, of the presence of chemical species in, uh, uh, in space. And uh, this is the reason why uh, we are uh, so interested in uh, spectroscopically characterize this uh, prebiotic molecule. Let me summarize what we need to spectroscopically uh, characterize this molecule from the rotational sp spectroscopy point of view. Uh, we need, uh, first of all, rotational constant, which are the um, leading terms, centrifugal distortion constant, uh, um, some hyperfine parameter like uh, the nuclear quadruple coupling constant, uh, uh, sorry, too fast, uh, are um, important, may provide uh, very useful information. But uh, uh, my time is limited, so I will address only the rotational constant. I think uh, all of you know that uh, rotational constant are inversely proportional to the corresponding uh, component of the inertia tensor. 
uh, inertia tensor, which in turn depends only on the molecular structure and the isotopic masses. This is the reason why rotational constants are so different from one uh, uh, chemical species to the other. So uh, it's a, a perfect technique for distinguishing uh, one molecule from the other. And also uh, the reason why um, we can uh, use a rotational spectroscopy for, uh, this, um, uh, for distinguish among uh, the different isotopic species. Uh, if we are interested uh, only in the uh, equilibrium rotational constant, what uh, we need on the basis of this expression is only the equilibrium structure. So what we have to run is uh, the most accurate geometry optimization we, we can. And for doing this, uh, we, um, uh, we use a uh, uh, composite scheme. Composite schemes are schemes um, in which all the contributions that are important for reducing the error we made in the computation are evaluated at the best possible level and put together uh, by resorting on the additivity uh, approximation. Uh, if we are aiming at high accuracies, the starting point uh, uh, is the CCSD parenthesis T method which is uh, nowadays defined as uh, the uh, golden standard for uh, accurate calculation. Uh, for sure, we have to uh, account for the extrapolation of, mm, to the complete basis set limit. It's important to include the effect of core correlation uh, and uh, in case we can go beyond the uh, CCSD parenthesis T uh, level. This approach was uh, tested for um, the uh, accurate prediction of a rotational constant already more than seven years ago. And if we report the result in terms of normal distribution of the relative error, what we realized that um, when we push a theory very close to the limit, essentially we get the right answer. So the normal distribution is very narrow and very well centered the uh, origin. So uh, this means that uh, we are uh, close to the um, uh, well, perfectly describing uh, the equilibrium structure. But uh, this is what happens when we take as a reference the, equilib the experimental equilibrium rotational constant. But uh, we are actually interested in uh, the, um, oh, yes, uh, I forgot I also mentioned, I would like also to mention this, that if we skip the uh, contribution of higher uh, excitation, we can get anyway a, a very good approximation for the equilibrium structure. And this is a level that is affordable up to medium size uh, molecule. But uh, as I was telling you, we are interested in vibrational ground state uh, rotational constant for um, describing the uh, and predicting the rotational spectrum. And what happens uh, uh, if we take as a reference the um, uh, vibrational ground state and rotational constant uh, is that uh, uh, the normal distribution is now rather broad uh, of the y-axis because we are missing one important contribution, uh, which is the, the uh, vibrational uh, correction. Uh, this approach can be used uh, for um, uh, for the spectroscopic characterization, characterization of small prebiotic uh, molecules, and we um, uh, we uh, demonstrated it, but uh, we want to go a step further. So we um, consider a few case uh, um, studies involving uh, um, semi-rigid. Uh, um, building block of biomolecule like a DNA basis and uh, um, flexible. Uh, flexible uh, building block of uh, um, biomolecule like amino acid and the small uh, dipeptide. Starting from the, um, the first case uh, study, um, what I have to mention uh, is that, uh, of course, we cannot use the, the methodology I've just introduced because it's not uh, affordable for uh, this kind of molecule. So we had to set up a, um, a different composite approach. 
uh, in which we have as a starting point uh, uh, still the CCSD parenthesis T method in conjunction with the uh, uh, tuple database set, but then we uh, evaluate all the correction required using uh, MP2. And we use a density functional for um, uh, con evaluating the uh, vibrational uh, correction. And if we applied, and uh, this is uh, what we did, uh, for instance, for the first, um, uh, first study of the rotational spectra of a TO Uracil, you can see the agreement is uh, perfect, uh, this uh, uh, resolution. If uh, we uh, zoom to improve the uh, resolution, it works. Um, what we uh, note is that the uh, agreement uh, is, uh, between experiment theory is uh, really impressive, and uh, we could predict uh, the position of the rotational transition with an accuracy better than 0.1%. In this case, the assignment of the spectrum was uh, rather straightforward because, as you might see in the uh, lower part of the uh, picture, the um, uh, spectrum is rather clean. The situation is completely different if you have to deal with a flexible molecule, because then you have more conformers uh, to account for, and uh, uh, this was the case, for instance, of uh, this uh, um, glycine dipetide analog. We found two uh, conformers stable in the gas phase, and uh, the corresponding spectra is rather crowded, uh, not only because of the um, overlap of the uh, rotational spectra of the two conformers, but also because of the um, tunneling motion of the N N2H uh, moiety. Uh, we have uh, the uh, splitting of the vibrational state in the A and E state. So we have the overlap of several uh, rotational uh, spectra. Anyway, if we just zoom to see uh, the uh, accuracy we uh, obtain in the prediction, we see that uh, once again, we could even for a flexible molecule, we couldn't predict uh, the position of the line, uh, the rotational lines with uh, a great uh, uh, accuracy. The very last topic I would like to touch is then uh, is um, the one uh, um, of the conformational analysis. When you have a flexible molecule and more uh, conformers, it's really important to uh, evaluate uh, um, accurately the relative uh, uh, energy. And this is uh, something that uh, uh, we can do. Um, once again, re um, resorting to uh, this uh, composite scheme, uh, if uh, we limit ourselves to single point energy calculation, we can use a uh, composite scheme entirely based on a Kepler cluster calculation. And this is important if for instance, if you would like to uh, search for glycine in the interstellar medium, and uh, this is uh, uh, something that uh, um, is uh, really uh, um, um, timely. Uh, there were some uh, uh, detection, but uh, they, they were um, not confirmed. But uh, uh, if you are f uh, looking for glycine, um, for instance, at a temperature of 200 Kelvin, which is the temperature typical of a torque core source, you should know which conformers to search for. Because at such temperature, the uh, glycine 1P, which is the most uh, stable conformers, is populated at 90%. The glycine 2N is populated only at 10%. But because it's a large egg, uh, component of the dipole moment, its rotational spectrum is three, four times stronger than uh, the rotational spectrum of the most stable and most uh, populated uh, conformers. Up to now, um, to our knowledge, uh, this search was only limited to glycine 1P. And uh, the reason is related to the fact in the spectroscopic database uh, 
um, largely used also by astronomers, the wrong energy difference is uh, uh, reported. And this uh, uh, too high energy difference, uh, um, energy for the uh, glycine 2 hand uh, leads to a population of this, uh, um, this conformer that uh, it's, uh, uh, in, it's uh, uh, negligible. With this, uh, uh, I've um, concluded, and I would like to thank you for your attention. So the uh, accuracy requirement for the direct uh, astronomical observation is really um, is really strict. So uh, you cannot have uh, um, uh, an uncertainty larger than a few megahertz, because uh, uh, in the interstellar medium you have, uh, uh, especially in, when you have uh, the uh, detection from uh, um, of the emission spectra of some astronomical object, you have the overlap of the rotational spectra of several species. So uh, some megahertz uh, might be uh, a, a strong difference, uh, and uh, you have uh, you might have uh, lines uh, in the surrounding. And so, for the uh, astronomical direct uh, astronomical observation, you need an accuracy of uh, on the rotational uh, lines uh, of a few uh, megahertz. For, the, um, for guiding uh, the laboratory measurement, uh, you might have uh, less accuracy, because uh, then you have uh, the uh, possibility to uh, scan different portions of, uh, of the, the spectra. Uh, the, the problem if you start from uh, less accurate uh, um, prediction and uh, in particular if uh, you don't uh, account for centrifugal distortion effect, uh, you might have uh, a, the, a prediction of the rotational spectrum which is wrong at a qualitative level. So everything uh, is uh, easy if you have to work a very, you can work at very low J value low frequency with a rigid, semi-rigid molecule. But as soon as uh, uh, you go higher in J or you have something flexible, uh, then uh, it's, uh, it's really important to have uh, a good prediction. Ask.
Ну, Uh, good uh, after afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizing committee that gave me the opportunity of uh, speaking today. In this talk, I'm going to present the first results about the absorption of glycolyhide on titanium dioxide by coupling quantum chemical calculations and risk spectroscopy. I anticipate that there will be some differences with uh, respect to the abstract contents, but this is because uh, these are ongoing results and therefore the work that has been carried out uh, during the last month has been inserted in this presentation as well. Uh, to start, I'd like uh, to spend a few words about the two players of the game. Need uh, on the one side, uh, in the last years there has been uh, increasing interest in the glycolyhide, mainly motivated by its detection in space. Indeed, uh, it has been first detected within the Sagittarius interstellar cloud, uh, then the toward a hot molecular core, and more recently it has been observed in the uh, IRAS protostellar system by means of the radio telescope ELMA. And the importance of this detection relies in the chemical formula of the glycolyhide, that is CH2OH, CHO, that makes this molecule to be considered as the smallest monosaccharide, which is also involved in the formation reaction that finally leads to ribose, the backbone of DNA. Further, it is a structural isomer of methylformate and acetic acid, both of which have been detected in space uh, as well. And therefore, the discovery of uh, glycolyhide brings uh, important clues about uh, the astrobiological processes that are taking place already on the universe. And further, pressing the amounts of a structural isomer is uh, important uh, because um, they can uh, help us uh, to understand the formation routes and further they, it uh, provides uh, important constraints for the astrochemical models. And under this point of view, it has been suggested that uh, the astrochemical synthesis of uh, glycolyhide may require some processes on the surface of dust grains. But in addition to this uh, astrochemical and astrobiological relevance, glycolyhide is also important from the atmospheric point of view, indeed it belongs to the family of uh, oxygenated volatile organic compound. It is directly produced during biomass burning and it is the transformation oxidation product of some substances emitted uh, directly or indirectly by some plants. And because of these uh, sources, the atmospheric concentration of glycolyhide high can reach the three parts per billion. And uh, the second player of the, the game, titanium dioxide, certainly doesn't need any presentation. And it is a, a widespread material employed for a number of applications that goes from cosmetics and foods, pigments and paints, gas sensors, catalysis and energy production. From the environmental point of view, it is employed for the production of photocatalytic cements and uh, self-cleaning coatings, which are able to, to some extent, of purifying air from atmospheric pollutants. And the working principle of this application takes advantage from the optoelectrical properties of this material. And uh, roughly speaking, when titanium dioxide uh, absorbs the UV light from the sun around 3.0, 3.2 electron volts, an electron hole pair is created and these charge carriers might migrate to the surface where they can react with the species eventually absorbed and this uh, uh, process finally leads to the decomposition of hazardous molecules into more environmentally friendly ones such as uh, carbon dioxide and water in the case of organic uh, uh, substances. And, uh, 
Here, uh, there are four studies aiming at uh, characterizing the interfacial interactions between uh, molecules and uh, surfaces. It is uh, extremely important in order to have a more uh, complete picture of uh, the reaction pathway, as well as to possibly design uh, catalysis with uh, improved performances. But what is less known probably about titanium dioxide is that it has been proposed to be one of the components of stardust. Indeed, it has been uh, speculated that uh, titanium dioxide molecules uh, can survive to the physical conditions around some stars and then act as uh, aggregation nuclei for other particles such as uh, silica and isomandos. And with uh, these premises in this work, we have investigated the absorption of glycolidehyl on titanium oxide theoretically by means of quantum chemical calculations that provided absorption energies, uh, geometries, and vibrational properties, uh, and, by me and experimentally by means of diffuse reflectance infrared Fourier transfer or simply drift spectroscopy. Indeed, uh, infrared and in particular drift spectroscopy is a well suited technique to study the interaction of molecules with the surfaces because of the vibrational spectrum of the absorbed molecules that generally differ from that of the free species provides important information about the functional groups mainly involved in the interaction with the surface. Unfortunately, absorption spectra are in general, with the exception of the smallest molecules, of difficult interpretation and therefore under this point of view molecular modeling provides uh, an uh, important tool for interpreting the experimental data as well as uh, to uh, provide a more complete picture of the absorption process. And for the purpose, seven different interaction models have been devised, which are here reported and labeled as uh, M1 to M7. You can see that uh, they differ for the functional groups involved in the interaction with the surface as well as uh, for the orientation of the molecule. For the modeling, the cis-sifts uh, conformer of glycolidehyde has been considered because it is the most stable one and the only one observed in the gas phase. Uh, computations have been carried out at b leap uh, level, augmented by dispersion correlation effects by means of the DFT-D2 scheme. And the periodic approach has been adopted. Specifically, the surface has been described as a, a six-layer uh, six atomic slab cut from the NOTAS back along the 101 plane. Geometry optimizations and frequency calculations have been carried out by using mostly double theta basis sets, whereas for the energy calculations, uh, triple theta basis sets uh, have been employed. And the resulting optimized structures are reported in this uh, slide together with uh, their corresponding binding energies and the main variation of uh, glycolidehyde structural parameters with respect to the gas phase uh, values. Although I cannot go too much in detail for time motivations, we can observe that uh, models two and three are actually the most stable one with a binding energy of, a man, of about minus 13 kilocal over mole. M1 looks like very similar to M3 and also M6 and M7 provides almost the same description of the absorption process. Interestingly, we can observe that the model M4 gives rise to a dissociative entering with the formation of a strained epoxidic ring, whereas in model M5, the oxygen of the carbonylic function binds to a titanium atom so that the carbon atom engages a bond with an oxygen of the surface in order to restore its tetravalency. And as a result in these two models, M5, M4 and M5, the carbonylic function is lost as highlighted by the elongation of the C2O2 bond by about 0.2 angstrom. And now the experimental stuff, the, uh, the spectra have been uh, recorded on a Brooker Vertex 70 FTRR spectrometer with installed a drift accessory in thermal equipped with uh, an environmental chamber for in situ operations. 
A sketch of uh, the experimental apparatus is reported in the three photographs of this slide. And uh, what uh, I would like to point out for the following discussion is that uh, the environmental chamber is enclosed by a dome with uh, three windows, two of a KBR for transmitting the infrared radiation, and one of quartz for viewing the sample or uh, uh, shining UV light uh, uh, on it. And the experimental stuff has been quite complicated, first of all, because uh, uh, glycolyhyde can be purchased as a beautiful wide crystalline solid, which, however, is not glycolyhyde. Indeed, it is uh, its a dimer, which is a one four, which has a one four dioxane uh, structure. A picture view is uh, reported uh, there, with uh, a melting point between 80 and 90 degrees. Fortunately, glycolyhyde has the tendency of sublimating, and therefore, in order to let molecules enter in the environmental chamber, the solid have been heated at uh, 85 and 95 degrees. Uh, experiments have been carried out. Uh, by exposing the surface at increasing loadings of uh, glycolyhyde for a total exposure time of 15 minutes with a spectra required, uh, acquired at time intervals of uh, uh, three minutes. But uh, problem do not finish here. Indeed, uh, glycolyhyde also condensates on the KBR windows. And this is well illustrated by the figure on the top left corner in which the trace A is the spectrum of glycolyhyde recorded with a cell having calcium chloride windows, whereas uh, traces B and C are again the spectra of the gas phase molecule, but this time recorded with uh, a KBR window cell. And one can really observe the emergence of new absorption, for example, there and there. And uh, this can be attributed to glycolyhyde condensed on KBR windows. This is uh, uh, in agreement with uh, the spectrum number D, which is the spectrum of the crystalline compound recorded in a KBR pilot. And therefore, in order to obtain the uh, absorption of the adsorbent molecule, um, a procedure minim based on the min a minimum least square fitting procedure has been adopted that the starting from the spectra of glycolyhyde with titanium dioxide, spectra 1, and uh, free glycolyhyde, spectra 2, provides the differential spectra of glycolyhyde adsorbed on titanium dioxide, where the absorption of the adsorbent molecule are maximized. But before interpreting this spectra, it is quite instructive to compare a theory and experiment already for the free molecule. And for the purpose, of full anharmonic computations have been carried out at the same level of theory by using the Gaussian 09 program. And uh, the results of this comparison are reported uh, in this column uh, here, where we can observe that the theory produces an uh, experiment with a mean deviation of minus 27 with numbers and a mean absolute deviation of uh, 30 with numbers. We can now move to the interpretation of the absorption spectra. The experimental spectra show a quite large number of uh, absorptions, most of which are of difficult interpretation, but the main experimental evidence is related to a red shift of a new one corresponding to the OH stretching and the new four band corresponding to the carbon stretching by about uh, uh, 50 and 40 wave numbers. And uh, with this in mind, we can move, move and, uh, what, uh, uh, and see what the theory tells us. It tells us that the models one, four, and five cannot be considered a good representation of the absorption process. Indeed, M1 is predicted to be a transition state, whereas models four, and five, as I highlighted previously, lack of the carbonylic function, which, however, is observed experimentally. Models uh, six and seven are similar. They correctly predict the redshift of new one and new four, but their binding energies are too weak in comparison to uh, those of models two and three which uh, in turn provide a, a quite good representation of uh, the absorption process as uh, suggested by traces of C and D, which are the corresponding simulated uh, spectra. Of these two models, in particular M3, correctly predicts the redshift of new one and new four, has the strongest absorption energy, and therefore it seems to be the most likely absorption configuration of glycolyhyde adsorbed on titanium dioxide. 
And uh, in summary, in this work, we have investigated the absorption of glycolyl anthocyanin dioxide by coupling Griff's spectroscopy to quantum chemical calculations. The interplay between theory and the experiment suggests that uh, the most likely absorption configuration involves the interaction of the carbonatic oxygen with the anthocyanin atom supported by a hydrogen bond between the hydroxylic proton and a two-fold coordinated surface oxygen. And despite the quite the good results of Trinidad, a, further, a number of further developments uh, can be uh, carried out. For example, one question that uh, should be addressed uh, is the presence of water, as there are some evidences at uh, the experimental level that a small amount of water vapor enter in the environmental chamber together with uh, uh, glycolyhide, the role of crystal defects uh, may be addressed, the energetic uh, may be computed uh, using a thicker slab, uh, and also it would be interesting to evaluate the uh, effects of the lateral interactions among the quad sort of molecule. And to finish, I'd like to thank uh, the group of molecular and computational spectroscopy of University of Foscari Venezia, in particular Professor Santi Giorgiani, Professor Paolo Stoppa, and uh, Dr. Andrea Pietropoli Charmet. A special thank goes to uh, Giorgio Cesarin, who actively contributed to this, to this work during her master's degree. I thank the Seneca Supercomputer Center, the Turing Cluster of University of Foscari. I thank the Italian Ministry for Financial Support through Print 2012 and the University of Foscari for my postdoc position. And obviously, thank you for the attention. An interesting questions. We didn't try, but it, it's one of the it's kind of farther. Easy, easy. Just it, 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 it looks like it will exchange the range. It looks very easy. So it's it it, it's possible in order to have a, an uh, experimental uh, advancement. Yes, sure. No more questions. So thanks again. Thank you. So I thank the organizers for having invited me to show some results we got on uh, the theoretical investigation of lanthanide complexes. Uh, basically, lanthanides are very interesting uh, species from an electronic point of view. Uh, they have uh, 4F orbitals, which are uh, shielded uh, very efficiently, let's say, from the 5S and 5P subshells. And they usually attain the plus 3 uh, redox state. Lanthanide ions uh, show a very interesting uh, kind of luminescence. In fact, they absorb at UV, uh, at UV and then uh, emit at uh, near infrared and uh, visible region. Uh, absorption, actually, it's weak because the, the 4F, 4F transitions are forbidden, basically. Uh, but uh, uh, what's very interesting is that emission uh, comes only from resonant levels, uh, which are represented in red in this scheme, uh, uh, energy scheme on the left. Uh, which means that obviously the emission is uh, line-like and this is obviously something which is very uh, wishable, let's say, from a technological application point of view. Uh, so uh, one of the things I would like to uh, say for the next slide is that uh, europium in particular, we will look a lot about europium, has a, a resonance level which is a, a mind, at mind energy, while gadolinium, for example, is, uh, has a resonance level which is very high in energy. And this is obviously relevance in the uh, luminescence uh, story. Uh, well, uh, let's see what uh, uh, 
one can do to try to have a 4F, 4F absorption uh, a little bit uh, more, such that technological application can be actually uh, carried out. So uh, the point is that obviously we can use antenna effect sensitization, uh, which means that we can install in the uh, coordination environment of the uh, lanthanide organic chromophores, uh, uh, suitable ones. Uh, when I say suitable, I say that in a simplified picture, we can think that after uh, this uh, uh, complexation, we can have uh, uh, that uh, upon uh, irradiation, the ligand goes from S0 to S1, then we can have an inter-system crossing to a T1 state of the ligand. At this point, we have competition between two possibilities, which is phosphorescence of the, of the ligand or an energy transfer, which uh, leads to uh, basically uh, populate the excited states of the uh, lanthanide in the, in, in the center of the complex. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, for this uh, energy transfer to occur, it's important that the excited states of the uh, lanthanides are localized in energy in, in a good uh, position, let's say. Uh, and uh, in the case, for example, of europium, the energy difference between the triplet of the ligands and uh, the uh, excited states of the europium are uh, usually uh, close to each other, which obviously favors uh, energy transfer. In the case of gadolinium, instead, basically we go very, very high, and this clearly uh, impairs uh, energy transfer. So, uh, more generally speaking, uh, so the uh, um, energy transfer between uh, the triplet T1 and the, uh, act, uh, the uh, excited state of the lanthanide affects the photoluminescence quantum yield in a very, very crucial way. And uh, one of the phenomenological rules that uh, usually are quite useful in uh, designing uh, complexes uh, with uh, good um, luminescent properties is that the, the, this, uh, uh, the energy difference should be within 2,500, 3,500 centimeters to the minus one. So as a, a first target, we wanted to uh, calculate the adiabatic transition energy, uh, so from S0 to T1, uh, which is clearly a very, very important uh, uh, parameter to uh, design these kind of complexes, and uh, uh, then compare this energy with experimental 0, zero transitions uh, uh, coming from phosphorescence, experimental phosphorescence spectra. The complexes we started uh, considering at the beginning were, were uh, this kind of uh, complexes. Uh, basically, uh, they are European beta decatonate complexes. The decatonate is this TTA uh, ligand, uh, and uh, uh, the TTA ligand differs uh, from uh, so among the, other, the various complexes. But uh, while the uh, phenantrolene ligand is always present, always the same in all these four complexes. And as a result, in the corresponding gadolinium complexes, the phosphorescent spectra are the ones uh, uh, shown here, experimentally obtained at low temperature, in frozen solution, basically. Uh -huh. Okay, so the computational details, we carried out calculations at DFT level, uh, using PB, 1PB, and can be relief hybrid functionals. Uh, then we use 631G basis, uh, basis set and the large core ECP with the corresponding basis set for the lanthanide. And uh, uh, we use the CPCM solvent effect. Uh, the triplet uh, uh, geometries were optimized to get uh, the delta SCF energies I will show you in the following. And we use the zeta P corrections. Uh, and we also calculated phosphorescent spectra, as we, uh, we will see, vibrational resolved uh, using basically the adiabatic Hessian approach. So uh, let's have a rapid look at the uh, coordination environment of this uh, uh, europium uh, complex. Uh, basically, it's a square antiprismatic coordination geometry in the ground state. Uh, this is uh, essentially the same uh, for all the complexes we will, uh, we will show, we will see in this, uh, in this presentation. So we'll focus now on the simplest, let's say, complex, which is this uh, UTTA3 uh, fan. Uh, complex. Uh, if we uh, uh, compute the time-dependent DFT at the time-dependent DFT level, the excitation energy the triplets in particular, we see that uh, the first three triplets are basically close to each other, and they are. Uh, um, uh, so the, this involves transition in at the level of the TTA ligands. While the fourth one, T4, it's actually much higher in energy, and this uh, involves basically the phenantrolene uh, moiety. This is important for the rest of the story. Uh, basically, we uh, computed uh, afterwards adiabatic transition at the SCF level, PB1, PB, for the TS0 
uh, transition. And what we see is that, again, the energy difference between the T1, T2, and T3 is very, very small, as you can see in the last uh, column of this uh, table, while uh, the T4 is much higher in energy in these uh, ener uh, uh, electronic different, uh, density different maps. You can see basically the electronic features of this triplet, the, the first three triplets. So when we focus uh, not only on the first of, the, of these complexes, but also on the other three I presented in the third slide, uh, what we can see is that uh, both at, uh, at PB, 1 PB level, and also, and mainly, let's say, at CAM B3 leap level, uh, the triplet uh, state is at energies which are close to the experimental value. Uh, this is not true for the fourth. But the fourth one, at experimental level, uh, showed a very, very low uh, quantum yield, so low that basically experimentalists uh, made an estimate only of the uh, uh, triplet level. Actually, this estimate seems to be largely overestimated. Uh, if we compare with our uh, results, we found theoretically uh, this 14,000 centimeters to the minus one, uh, with respect to the 19,000, and this clearly would bring the energy level of uh, the excited state uh, uh, of the um, ligand too low to allow the energy transfer, which clearly leads to uh, the uh, photoluminescence of the uh, lanthanide. So, also when we try to reproduce the, the uh, phosphorescence spectra we saw uh, at the in introduction, we can see that basically we can reproduce the shape quite well. Uh, and also the, the shift uh, of the uh, maxima for the three uh, compounds investigated. So, okay, this is a nicer way to represent the same concept. So given the fact that we, it seems that this approach uh, uh, is successful for, this, uh, for the investigation of these kind of systems, we started a new uh, work uh, which is uh, currently ongoing and I will show just some results which are uh, preliminary. Uh, this uh, complex is uh, a bit the reciprocal in terms of structure with respect to the ones we have seen before because here the beta decatonate is always the same in 4A, 4B, and 4C, why? What's different is the, the substituted phenantrolene. We have just one substituent, this R uh, here, which changes from uh, in, in the three cases. And uh, this change is not that large, actually. So uh, when uh, the experimentalists try to uh, get the phosphorescence spectra for these complexes in ethanol uh, solution, frozen also here, uh, one sees a quite large shift, uh, particularly between, for example, 4C and 4A, as you can see in the uh, lower part right of the, uh, of the slide, which is kind of surprising given the relatively um, small differences among these complexes. So, uh, well, if we consider, for example, 4B, we are able uh, to uh, reproduce quite well the phosphorescence spectrum uh, of the complex considering states centered in the, four, uh, in the 4B ligand. This is, uh, if we consider the shape of the, uh, of the spectrum, quite uh, uh, which basically true also for uh, 4C and 4B. While as you can see in the lower part, uh, the, the uh, computed spectra, we are unable to reproduce the shift of the spectrum. This is true also uh, for, uh, for 4A. And this is basically true also if you consider, we consider the calculated free ligands on the right in this slide. The point is, uh, the hypothesis we are testing right now is that having uh, taken this uh, phosphorescence spectra in ethanol might have led basically if, uh, to have a coordination of ethanol at the level of the europium uh, ion uh, of the, the lanthanide, and this um, might have led to a blue shift of the, of the spectrum. This is uh, something which is basically uh, starts to be confirmed also by calculation. In the lower part of this uh, slide, we see the uh, spectra for the uh, free ligand uh, after rotation uh, of the uh, oxadiazole uh, moiety. Uh, obviously, uh, a similar rotation would happen if ethanol um, coordinates the uh, lanthanide uh, because the oxadiazole would be unable at that point to coordinate to the, uh, to the lanthanide. So what we can say is that 
uh, DFT seems to be more and more important in the uh, design of this kind of luminescent species, uh, and we are able to uh, compute in a quite uh, reliable way uh, one of the uh, fundamental um, parameters for determining photoluminescence quantum yield. Uh, also, the experimental phosphorescent spectra are quite uh, well reproduced, and uh, uh, these clearly uh, can be useful also if we want to understand a little bit more the effect of the solvent, as we have seen in the last uh, slide, uh, and so to better interpret it, uh, basically, uh, experimental results on uh, quite uh, complicated supramolecular systems like the one I just showed you. I would like to, to thank, obviously, all the co-workers here at uh, SNS, uh, at uh, also Milano Bicocca University. Uh, fundings basically come from Milano Bicocca, and I thank you for your kind attention. So, from the technology point of view, I think it is actually used, European complexes. You can conjugate them with uh, biomolecules, for example, and uh, this can be absolutely relevant. And also for uh, lead, for example, is quite, quite relevant. And for the uh, relativistic part, let's say, the, the, here, the ECP includes uh, also the F orbitals, and it's a quasi-relativistic approach. This, uh, this is a doll, the, the, the author, is dog, so we have treated this uh, at this level, basically. Uh, I actually, with curiosity, have you tried simply to acquire the spectrum in a different solvent in order to disprove or to prove the involvement of ethanol? In yeah, but if you don't, uh, if you don't treat it explicitly. No, I mean the acquired experimental spectrum. Ah, that would be something that we might uh, tell to the. <laughs> to the authors of the paper, so, yes. It's always good to, to <laughs> test on both sides. <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely agree. This might be a very good okay. idea. Okay, no more questions, so thanks again. Thank you very much. The part and uh, the what is the, the thing for the mm. okay. Mm. okay, the point and I love the point and Okay. Uh, so, I thank the organizer for being here in uh, explaining to you part of uh, our uh, um, work on the, the interaction between nanoparticles and uh, uh, the biological environment. In particular, I'm going. Hmm? What else? Ah, okay. Uh, in, in particular, um, I'm going to um, show you the results of uh, uh, the interaction between. Uh, gold nanoparticles and proteins 
and uh, uh, first, and then um, the um, how to uh, use uh, bioglass nanoparticles uh, as a carrier for uh, biological relevant species. So it is well known that uh, um, the very first uh, um, nanoparticle contact bo um, body fluids, um, they are covered by um, a layer of protein, or um, more in general, uh, biological uh, molecules, um, which form a um, corona around the nanoparticles, and this uh, the um, biological identity of uh, the bioparticle itself. In fact, uh, um, the corona mediate the interaction between um, nanoparticles and uh, uh, the cells that sees the corona and interaction with. And um, so the characterization of the uh, corona is uh, uh, very important to understand how uh, is uh, the reaction of the cell to the exposure to the nanoparticle. But uh, unfortunately, notwithstanding, um, many studies are carried on in uh, this subject, um, a comprehensive picture of the phenomenon is not uh, known uh, because of the complexity of the uh, system itself and because of the experimental dilemma of measuring without uh, changing the nature of uh, the original protein corona. So in this field, the uh, opportunity to use uh, computational simulation to explain, to help to explain the, um, the um, experimental results is uh, very important. Uh, for this reason, we have carried on uh, several studies on the interaction between uh, um, gold nanoparticles and uh, proteins with the, um, the aims of uh, uh, assessing the effect of the size of the nanoparticle, uh, the size of the environment, and uh, um, environment, um, uh, for example, uh, the use of uh, bare nanoparticles or coated nanoparticles, and how we can model the uh, the coated nanoparticle in, with uh, implicit or explicit models, and uh, a protein concentration and protein uh, competition. Uh, we'll show you just a flavor of the results because we have um, for the time. And uh, that is a little bit out of sight. Um, so the system we use uh, is, consists of a um, gold nanoparticle um, represented as a repulsive sphere um, of, and we use different sizes, um, covered by um, beads, charged beads, randomly distributed on that. And uh, um, the sphere is surrounded by a number of proteins, uh, which are uh, different, for example, in this case, um, I show you uh, proteins of different shape and uh, uh, number of amino acids. Um, these are ubiquitin, insulins, and fibrinogens, and they're put um, in a random way, uh, uh, far away from the, um, the gold nanoparticle at the beginning, and uh, the simulation gone, and uh, they uh, will interact with, with the nanoparticle. The, um, all the system is uh, embedded in a sphere that is a containing sphere. It's, uh, uh, it is uh, used to prevent uh, um, proteins uh, evaporation. Since the, the, all the system is very big, um, because we want to use a, a lot of proteins, uh, we use um, molecular dynamics simulation with, um, in the coarse-grained um, approximation. And the total number of bids uh, you see uh, run from uh, more than 500 to more than 15,000. The results. Uh, for example, for the um, kinetics of uh, corona formation, um, 
we uh, find that uh, um, the kinetics is uh, uh, consistent with a three-step model for protein absorption. And here is a report um, for uh, the result for the ubiquitins. Um, we found that the ubiquitins at, at the very first of the simulation uh, move around the nanoparticles without uh, uh, interacting with them. And uh, uh, this is shown in the graph by uh, the Rubin square deviation, of, uh, which are very high, uh, at least for the first uh, um, one nanosecond. Um, then um, the protein become attracted by the um, electrostatic potential of the nanoparticle and start to move on the nanoparticle surface till uh, they found uh, the, opti the optimal interaction site and stuck on the nanoparticle in the last part of the simulation. The, the maximal number of uh, proteins that can be uh, absorbed on the um, nanoparticle uh, obviously depend on the, on the protein and on the dimension of the nanoparticle. Here I, I reported the results for um, insulins, uh, which uh, are interacted with a nanoparticle of uh, five nanometers. And uh, the maximum number of uh, insulin absorbs um, is uh, 20, and it is obtained after uh, 40 picoseconds when in the simulation box there are more than 70 uh, proteins. The interesting thing is that if, oh, that is, uh, there is a part which is left, but uh, I can explain it. Um, the interesting thing is that if we put in the simulation box a different kind of uh, protein, uh, for example, in this case, I show the result of uh, a box of insulins with fib fibrinogens. The result is that uh, uh, the number of insulins, that, uh, the, or in general, the number of proteins that come down uh, on the um, nanoparticle is uh, um, lower quite a lot. Um, in this graph, uh, I present an, um, two, ki um, two kinds of uh, simulation in which uh, in the first one there are 10 insulin and one fib fibrinogen and the second one uh, 34 insulins and four fibrinogens. Uh, you can see if you compare the graph with the uh, number in this table that for the first case, when the insulin are alone in the simulation box, the maximum number that uh, um, combined is five. For uh, the second one is uh, when uh, there are only insulins, um, 34 insulins, the maximum number is 12. So uh, now when there is a, a fibrinogen in the simulation box, the maximum number of insulin that combines is uh, uh, two or three. And the same effect is on uh, fibrinogens, which uh, uh, is disturbed by the presence of uh, uh, insulins, and uh, it combines only in the first case uh, after 20 picoseconds. Um, finally, the, um, we wanted to test also if it is possible that uh, uh, proteins bind contemporaneously to um, several nanoparticles. And what we found here is that fibrinogens can bind, in effect, to nanoparticles at the end, but at the expense of uh, um, a little bend of the fiber. Uh, which is not huge, is uh, uh, 20, around 20 degrees in agreement with the spectroscopic study. And, uh, but um, the, the bending produces um, partial unfolding of the protein in the central part of the molecule, uh, which is uh, biologically 
very relevant because uh, it put uh, in um, evidence part of the molecules that combine to integrins and uh, um, uh, producing the release of cytokines that give rise to inflammation uh, effects. So the use of uh, um, nanoparticles with, uh, in the part of the body where uh, fibrinogen is uh, uh, rich in uh, concentration is not uh, um, a good idea. Um, in the second part of my talk, I want to show you uh, the results of uh, um, the study of bioglasses, uh, nanoparticle of bioglasses uh, used as a carrier for uh, uh, biological relevant uh, species. And the idea was, uh, uh, was triggered by this uh, study in, in which, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, they show that uh, uh, nanoceria uh, <coughs> has astonishing pharmacological potential um, because uh, of uh, its improved um, properties with respect to the bulk material. Um, uh, the nanoparticles of, of cereal are well tolerated by the organism, but the most important thing, they can mime the behavior of key antioxidant enzymes like catalase, and so can be used as, uh, uh, to cure the inflammation and uh, pathologies which are associated with uh, the oxidative stress. So, um, we want to, uh, to see if uh, uh, this important property can be um, uh, uh, exerted also by bioglasses. And uh, uh, this is important because, because uh, um, the, the use of bioglasses which, uh, uh, with some sort of uh, um, properties that prevent of oxidative stress after implantation uh, will be will shorten the convalescence and can be reduced the anti-inflammatory uh, drugs that uh, have to be administered to the patients and will be uh, very helpful in osteoporosis. Uh, you, you may know that uh, uh, bioglasses uh, are uh, uh, glasses made of uh, uh, silica and, uh, and a few other uh, oxides. And um, uh, the, the peculiarity is that uh, in contact with the body fluids uh, lead to the formation of uh, calcium phosphate um, that precipitate on the, uh, on the bone. And uh, um, in this uh, help in, uh, um, in the in reconstruction of uh, the bone itself and uh, as also regenerative potential. Uh, so we, we use these two uh, sort of, uh, nano, of uh, glasses, bioglasses, and we dope it, uh, them with, the, with cerium, and we try to make uh, nanoparticles of them. From the computer point of view, uh, we start with uh, um, uh, a preformed glass uh, in a cube box uh, made of more than uh, 10,000 atoms. And we play a little bit with, uh, um, uh, we remove the boundary condition, we play a little bit with uh, the spherical restraints potential and temperature. Uh, till we have uh, um, a round nanoparticle of uh, uh, 32 um, amstrom of uh, radius and uh, with the same density uh, as the um, uh, glass, bioglass in the, in the cube. Uh, the results are uh, shown uh, um, for uh, uh, as uh, atomic fraction profiles of the two species, uh, cerium-3 and cerium-4. And you can see uh, that uh, the behavior of uh, uh, these two species, of the distribution of these two species, uh, uh, is very different uh, 
um, among the, uh, the two classes, and uh, both in the bulk and in, on the surface. We can consider the surface starting from here, uh, more or less 25, 27 hems from uh, to 32. And uh, uh, the most important thing is that at the surface, um, in the first case, there is um, a, a ratio of, from, of the, the two species which is in favor for uh, Sirius III. Um, instead, in the second case, uh, the two species are more or less in the same amount on the surface. And this is, this has a rele this is relevant for the um, uh, activity of the bio, um, bio glass nanoparticles as uh, catalase mimetic um, activity. In fact, in the um, mechanism of uh, this mutation of uh, oxid, uh, hydrogen peroxides, um, both of the species are needed in the same, uh, the same concentration. So we conclude that uh, the second uh, glass is uh, more efficient for uh, Explicating um, uh, this kind of uh, activity, and uh, in fact, uh, the uh, the result of the um, experimental uh, studies, which has been carried on um, contemporaneously, uh, show that uh, uh, this is the depletion of uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide um, as a function of soaking time of the nanoparticle in. Uh, in uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide, and we see that after uh, seven days, we have the same results in the depletion from the two glasses, but uh, this is more efficient because uh, uh, the amount of nanoseria is uh, less than in this one. So, the, the results are still, uh, the, the studies are still uh, going on in this subject, and, um, but uh, we are quite pleased with the first uh, um, uh, results that we have obtained. Um, most of the studies of this study have been um, carried on uh, by Francesco Tavanti, uh, who is a um, uh, doctorate in my lab, and uh, Francesco Muni Miranza, who is a postdoctor. And uh, this is uh, my group. The, we are setting now in the new department at the University of Modena. And uh, I have to thank also um, the ministry for uh, uh, the grants and uh, you for uh, your attention. And on, on experimentally, from the experimental point of view, we have several layers. Uh, in our simulation, we got uh, two layers uh, only with the ubiquitin uh, proteins, uh, not for insulin, for example. Even so, in the first layer, yeah. the second one I can choose to be, to be next, side by side, to the first one, or uh, Is, anywhere else on the sphere. No, usually, uh, at least for ubiquitin, uh, they are uh, in, a, uh, in a red line. From, so you have the first corona and the second corona and so on. Um, but we got it uh, only for uh, uh, ubiquitin, not for insulins, for example. Uh, it must depend, it depends on the... Um, Electrostatic potential uh, right. on the so surface. Your, your model allows an interpretation, like fits with the experimental information on the behavior of the different problems. Yes, yes. And usually, um, uh, I, I didn't show in 
because I have no time, but uh, it's much <laughs> the, the nanoparticles are not uh, um, nude in, in, the, in the body fluids, but are surrounded by um, the solvent in which uh, they have been uh, um, obtained. So uh, all these studies have been done uh, with solvent as, uh, with uh, citrates as a solvent. And if you um, model it uh, implicitly or explicitly, uh, you obtain different uh, uh, results. Okay. So thanks again, Christina, and thanks for And uh, it is a pleasure for me to invite the first speaker, Chiara Capelli, of the host institution to present her talk about uh, uh, toward the reliable virtual modeling of key optical properties and spectroscopies. I please, uh, all the speaker has have to be in, uh, to respect the time schedule. Now? Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, oops. For some reason, okay. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. I'm particularly pleased uh, to be, not even here, but especially talking at this meeting. Uh, I've been a chair of uh, uh, sessions of these meetings in previous editions, but this is my first time as speaker. So, uh, what uh, I want to uh, tell you uh, about today is what we have been doing uh, in the last years towards uh, the development of uh, methods for uh, obtaining a reliable virtual modeling uh, of chiral optical properties and spectroscopies. So what is the idea of this work? So we start from uh, sample interacting with some kind of radiation and uh, uh, we want to, to calculate the response of this sample to uh, the external radiation and combination general of uh, electromagnetic fields uh, so that the final calculation gets accurate uh, results uh, which are directly comparable with experiments. Mm? And uh, uh, what is particularly challenging is that uh, not only we want to get accurate results, but especially we want to uh, model uh, large systems and complex systems, not uh, small systems uh, made of uh, just few atoms, but complex systems and especially when uh, these systems uh, live uh, in their natural environment, such as uh, aqueous solution, proteins, DNA, and uh, an external matrix uh, in general. Okay. So, uh, the comparison between calculation and experiments uh, is especially challenging. Why? Because uh, besides an, uh, an accurate modeling uh, of uh, the target system, uh, we sh should have also uh, reliable modeling uh, also of the conformational distribution. So uh, it is needed that uh, we have uh, a reliable uh, energetics of uh, uh, our molecule uh, in, uh, in the sample. And uh, since the, the, the experiment uh, is performed at some temperature, we must include the temperature, vibrations, uh, and as far as vibration is concerned, possibly in a physical way, so in the anharmonic uh, uh, regime. Another uh, factor which is especially important, and uh, it is what I will uh, focus on today, is uh, that uh, in order to compare experiments uh, performed in solution or in general in some kind of external environment, the environment uh, must be considered in the calculation. Among the 
various properties that uh, I have uh, studied uh, in, during the years, I will especially focus on chiroptical properties and spectroscopies. Why? I will show you that they are very interesting and important in life and in various uh, fields of chemistry, but also they are particularly challenging for theory. So, why uh, is chirality interesting and relevant to our lives? We know that uh, nature has selected only one enantiomer uh, relevant to life. And uh, uh, this has in important uh, applications also, uh, of uh, daily application, I would say, because uh, in general, when you take a drug, uh, you take some kind of uh, enantiomer, okay? In general, drugs are not racemic, but uh, are uh, pure enantiomers. Why? Because uh, since we are chiral, the interaction between us and a chiral form of a drug is something that may be good or very bad, but the, the interaction of the racemic in general is not effective. Hmm? Here are some examples. For instance, everybody knows, uh, I think, uh, omeprazole, which is, uh, as drug is in the S uh, con con conformer. Naproxen is S. And what is also relevant, everybody knows that uh, some issues, very <laughs> serious issues, as raised because uh, the, the third uh, drug, which is shown here, which is uh, uh, thalidomide was uh, um, uh, given to pregnant women as uh, uh, racemic, but uh, uh, soon they realized that uh, whereas the R form was uh, uh, effective uh, against uh, nausea, for example, the S uh, is mutagenic. Okay? So uh, I have stressed that. Uh, uh, especially in case of drugs, we need to uh, devise whether in a, we have an S or R form. So we have to have a way of determining the absolute configuration. How can we determine the absolute configuration? Uh, there are uh, various kind of techniques. Some are, uh, are the so-called chemical uh, techniques, so the you can use the uh, interaction between your drug and some kind of enzyme or whatever, which is chiral. But uh, what is uh, nowadays most used is the interaction of uh, the chemical with uh, uh, the circularly polarized uh, light, uh, measured either in absorption, refraction, or scattering. What is relevant is that uh, the sign of the chiroptical response, so the interaction between this light and your molecule, is, uh, can be used as a fingerprint to distinguish between the two enantiomers. Nowadays, many chiroptical properties and techniques have been developed uh, using the electronic or vibrational uh, ranges uh, of the uh, spectrum. And uh, uh, they are nowadays the most used, uh, not even in the academia, but also in the industry, to discriminate and to uh, assign the absolute configuration. Among them, the oldest ones uh, are for sure measurement of the optical rotation or uh, the measurement of the absorption, the chiral absorption in the electronic uh, uh, due to the electronic transitions, which means uh, electronic circular dichroism spectrum. Uh, most recently, uh, other techniques uh, have become uh, uh, relevant, such as, uh, uh, in this case, for instance, uh, uh, the analog of the uh, circular dichroism, but in the infrared range, mm? which is called vibrational circular dichroism. You can measure the vibrational, the chiroptical vibrational response in absorption or even in scattering, and this gives rise to the so-called Raman optical activity. These are, for instance, uh, uh, representative spectra. 
What's the difference between uh, uh, electronic chiroptical uh, techniques and vibrational chiroptical techniques? Here you see S nicotine, so small drug, and uh, um, on top, uh, you see electronic circular dichroism for both enantiomers, whereas uh, at the bottom you see the vibrational circular dichroism. And you immediately see that uh, you have much more information on the vibrational spectrum with respect to the electronic one. So each of the peaks in the VCD is one normal mode. So that, based on that, uh, you have many uh, more ways of uh, assigning your configuration. The same also is true for uh, other techniques. For instance, here is uh, electronic circular dichroism of uh, uh, chemotrypsin. So you see that uh, they have this spectrum here. This is the measured. And what is done in general is to assign uh, uh, the structure based on the comparison between uh, uh, theoretical spectra and uh, uh, experimental ones. So this is the sign signal in, in case you want to have the uh, electronic CD. If you want to have a Raman optical activity, for instance, which is a technique which nowadays uh, has uh, an important role uh, for studying proteins, uh, also viruses, uh, and uh, macromolecules in general, you see immediately that then here you can span all the wave numbers and then you have many signals. So in general, there is much more uh, structural detail in the vibrational optical activity with respect to the electronic optical activity. Okay. How can we assign the absolute configuration? So I've, see, I've said that uh, a specific uh, characteristics of chiroptical spectroscopies is that uh, they have a positive sign for one enantiomer and negative for the other one. So if the S has a positive structure of peaks, for instance, or positive negative patterns, the R has the mirror image. But the problem is that if you only rely on experiment, you can measure whatever spectrum, but you cannot assign if it is the spectrum of the R or the S. Of the S. So it is unclear how you can assign the spectra to the different enantiomers. And the only way which has been revealed to be the one of choice to assign in the absolute configuration is to compare experiments and calculations. This seems to be easy, but for sure, if you want to do that, you have to gain a reliable modeling of your spectrum. If you, for instance, uh, simulate the spectrum and you get the wrong sign, you get the wrong assignment. Okay? The role that uh, the quantum chemistry, in particular, has in this field is so, so huge that uh, this person, Prasad Polavarapo, who is one of the leading experimentalists in this field, has uh, spoken about uh, a renaissance in chiroptical spectroscopic methods as a result of the availability of uh, quantum uh, chemistry programs. And reading what uh, Polaborapo says, we see that uh, he says that uh, the use uh, of chiroptical spectroscopic methods uh, to determine the absolute configuration is gaining renewed interest with the availability of quantum mechanical methods. And uh, the, the role and the impact uh, is so huge that uh, once we have Get or obtain the availability of quantum mechanical programs, these methods have attracted numerous new researches to this area. So nowadays, what the experimentalists do is uh, measure their spectra in vibrational range, especially, uh, perform a calculation, compare, and then say, OK, I have this sign pattern. This is the S, because the calculation says that it is the S. So, the assignment is generally done by comparing the sign of the responses. But the calculation must be reliable, I have said. And what is needed? Uh, to get uh, an accurate 
modeling of this kind of properties is particularly challenging because you need to have at the same time an accurate prediction of energies, structural data, but also it is a mix, it is a, a response uh, due to the mixed uh, combination of electric and magnetic field. And both the electric and magnetic components of your, of your radiation must be treated with the same level of accuracy. So I cannot focus only on the electric part and you know, forget the magnetic and vice versa. So they have to be accuracy uh, computed and balanced. Also, in general, uh, only very few cases of measurements of isolated systems exist, but in general what they do is to dissolve the drug, or in general the target system, in some kind of solvent, measure the spectrum. Okay? So, in general, these measurements are done in condensed phase. This means that, in order to account for all of that, you have also to uh, have reliable modeling of the interaction between your uh, system and the environment. How, can, uh, um, how large is the solvent effect, for instance, in case of chiroptical response? Here is this molecule, methyloxyrane, and uh, this is experimental, so if Let's measure the optical rotation of methyloxyrane dissolved in various kind of solvents. And you see that uh, by moving from a polar to polar solvents, not only the absolute value of your response changes, but also the sign in case of water. Okay? So Solvent may, may be very relevant, not only affecting the absolute value, but also the sign. Imagine that uh, I calculate uh, this value in gas phase, probably I will be around here, but if I want to use this value for modeling water, I get a wrong sign, and then a wrong assignment. Okay. How can we model uh, environmental effects uh, on uh, molecular properties and spectroscopies? In general, we have two different uh, models. One is resorting to discrete models, so you keep an atomistic description both for your solute and the solvent, or you can use continuum solvation models, such as, for instance, the polarizable continuum model. I have worked a lot on the polarizable continuum model for many years, and nowadays this is the standard. So in general, if you look at the literature and you see calculations of uh, chiroptical properties in solution, they resort to the PCM. Okay? I don't want today to discuss the PCM. This is nowadays a standard modeling. I will only give you a couple of reviews where you can uh, find uh, uh, the state of the art on this matter. This is the one that I have done with my uh, original uh, group, I would say. And uh, there is another one, most recent, uh, also with Enzo and Julien, uh, on uh, both are on chirality, which is a journal uh, on chirality for sure. Okay? So the, the PCM is uh, the standard um, way of modeling solvent effects. Is it good or not? Strongly depends on the molecule. Sometimes may be very, very good, but sometimes may be very, very wrong. For instance, here. Again, optical rotation of methyloxyrane. This is the experiment. This is the calculation. Okay, you see cyclohexane is more or less okay. Carbon tetrachloride, acetone, acetonitril are more or less okay. Benzene, not so good, but at least the, the sign is preserved. Water is completely wrong. Why? This is an effect of the, what they, the experimentalists call the solvent chiral imprint. So, this means that if you have your solute in a solvent, the solvent is not a passive uh, 
actor here, but he's an active one. I mean that uh, he may, there is a contribution to these properties, in particular, arising from the caging of the solvent around the, your solute. The PCM is a mean field model, and then you cannot uh, recover anything like this. So, how can we try to model this phenomenon? I have said that in PCM, for sure, by definition, is not possible. And then what we, we did is uh, to develop a completely new method. But what we want to do is to keep what is good in PCM, which is that it is a polarizable embedding, by definition. Polarizable continuum model is a polarizable embedding. And then we moved to a three-layer model, QM, MM, PCM, so that the MM part is completely polarizable. So you have a self-polarization between the QM and the MM part. And then we add a third PCM layer. Based on this model, what we, have, we did is to define fully polarizable QM, MM, PCM, Hamiltonian, and extend it to chiroptical properties and spectroscopies. In, in order to extend to chiroptical properties and spectroscopies, in particular, these are particularly challenging properties. I will particularly focus on the op vibrational ones. You need to have all these ingredients. Okay? So, uh, wave function, structure, so geometry optimization, second derivatives, transition moments, electronic, uh, magnetic, and quadruple in some cases. And also, since you have the magnetic uh, field inside, uh, for sure, gauge invariance, response theory, and all these ingredients. So, what we did was to define this PCM, uh, QM, FQ PCM Hamiltonian and then to derive all these properties. Okay, so uh, how can we do that? So we start from the general expansion of the energy for a three-layer model. And uh, what we want uh, is to define the energy so that uh, the energy of, of each subsystem is defined and it is variational with respect to the corresponding density of charge. We see the interaction between the layer as classical, so no exchange effects. And uh, we, I, I will, the following, uh, uh, focus on SCF uh, uh, description. We have done also a couple cluster, but uh, I will not uh, give you any details on that. This is the ba basic energy. We are not particularly interested in, in energy for chiroptical spectra. Uh, we will see how can we, we can obtain derivatives. Mm? The force field that we use, uh, this is a general formulation of a force field. In general, the classical force field are not polarizable, meaning that uh, the charges that you use to model uh, the MM part are fixed. We use instead polarizable force field where the charges are adjusted to the molecular density. Mm? This is the basic of what we call a fluctuating, fluctuating charges uh, uh, force field. In our case, uh, um, we resort to the so-called electronegativity equalization principle. So that we say that at the equilibrium, the instantaneous electronegativity of each atom has the same value. We express the energy in this way, and the coupling is done in this way, where this is the so-called Ono kernel. Other possibilities may be also used. By using the electronegativity equalization principle, you can write a functional depending on such charges, and then you can define your charges, defining the MM portion, by using this matrix equation. This is for the MM part. We need also the couplings. The couplings between the MM, QM, PCM, are done in this way, where the Qs are the fluctuating charges and the sigmas are the uh, PCM charges. Mm? So once you have done, you can have also the couplings. 
once you we have done this one, you may write uh, your SCF energy in this way. P for sure is the density matrix. You have the FOC operator so that you can solve the equation, obtain the energy, but also what is needed is energy first and second derivatives. Here uh, in red are the contribution due to the fact that we have this polarizable embedding. So what you need is define your quantum mechanical equations and see where you have additional contributions. Define them, they are written in terms of the charges, these FQ charges, and then define the, polar, the, the, the operators so that uh, you have uh, your system which is uh, uh, defined. Hmm? These are first and second derivatives, so you can, you can have uh, geometry optimization, frequencies, intensities, vibrational. We did also uh, linear response and uh, uh, TDDFT gradients. So we may now also optimize uh, and uh, uh, mm, the uh, excited state. As I said, in case of chiroptical properties, we have the magnetic field uh, as a player. And since you have a quantum mechanical density with an external distribution of charges, uh, you have a problem of gauge. Uh, what's that? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> switch off. Uh, automatically will, will automatically switch off in 30 seconds. No. I don't see anything like this here. Yeah. This, the, the, the gauge invariance uh, <laughs> here was disrupting everything. <laughs> anyway, my, my screen is on, so uh, th this was the... <laughs> Anyway, you know, è rosso qua, e se è spento lo schermo è andato in stand-by questa cosa qui. Questo è rosso. Ah, ok, maybe now, yeah. Ok, let's see. Ok, ah, ok. <laughs> So this is exactly what happens in case that your calculation is not gauge invariant. Okay. So you have uh, an orientation, you get a, a value, you change x and y, whatever, you get another one. Okay, this is something which is unphysical. And uh, uh, since you have a distribution of charges around your solute, you have uh, an additional term that uh, you should include. And also we did, okay, so we have uh, electronic, uh, uh, properties, electric and magnetic response, so we can calculate uh, with this uh, also uh, optical rotation, for instance, this, this quantity, so we have this one, we have this one, VCD, we have all the ingredients there. This is our optical rotation, VCD. We might have electronic circular dichroism, no problem, it's absorption. We did uh, the TD, the FT linear response uh, for uh, the FQs. You can have uh, something more uh, exotic, which is Raman optical activity. And uh, this is third derivatives. So we started from uh, the definition of the third derivatives. This is our polarizability derivative with respect to the coordinate. Then you work out all your equation and you realize that you have additional terms depending on the, de the derivative of the density matrix. This is the alpha, so the electric component. You have 
the uh, electric magnetic field component. So this is man, uh, electric dipole, magnetic dipole, three contributions, uh, and also electric dipole, uh, quadrupole contribution. Okay, so all this uh, uh, may be done, and we have done very, very recently. So we may also have a Raman optical activity. Example again, let's uh, go back to the methyl oxygen, where the PCM was absolutely wrong in water. Okay, so we decided, we, we said, okay, let's try this model for the optical rotation of methyl oxygen in water. Here is the protocol. So we optimize methyl oxygen, we calculate uh, uh, vibrational correction, so we include vibrations and temperature by using the PCM would be very, very uh, time consuming by using this way. We perform molecular dynamic simulation. We decide to, to, to have the methyl oxygen rigid, okay? And we extracted the snapshots, 2,000 snapshots, and for each of them, we perform our QM, FQ, PCM calculation of the optical rotation. Then we take the average. What happens? So first, okay, this is the molecule. So we have methyl oxygen with the, few hundred of uh, water around in the snapshots, treated with this FQ and the PCM as a third layer. What about the optical rotation? If you wish to, say, to, if you wish to see, this is the variation of the optical rotation in time. Maybe you don't see, but it is. You may have, depending on the snapshot you get, you may have plus 100 or minus 100. Okay, so the variability is very, very huge. But then we don't particularly care about the single points, but on the average. And with this, let me comment on what is generally done in this case, in case that you want to uh, improve the PCM. You use cluster models. So mo molecule with a few molecules, explicitly treated around, plus PCM. You have one of these randomly, okay? But here what is interesting is not the single point, but the average, and you, if you calculate the average, this is vacuum, PCM is six, we recover the sign and the absolute value. Not only for one wa wavelength, but also for different wavelengths here, and not only for a specific uh, density functional, but uh, for various uh, so, we think it, that this is a very, very good result. This was optical rotation. VCD, the stick spectrum is uh, each snapshot has a, a, a rotational strength. Here you immediately realize. And the, the orange is the average. Here, the, 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 the situation is more clear, so I, I would say that uh, you know, the design is more or less uh, defined, so we don't have variability, unless we see this mm, tiny band, and then uh, by enlarging, we see that uh, even in this case, we have plus or minus sign, even if you know, the range is much smaller. What about the comparison with the PCM? Uh, PCM here is red, our model is blue, experiment is uh, uh, black. For instance, in this case, we see that the PCM uh, does not accurately reproduce this peak. And with respect to the comparison between our model and uh, uh, the experiment, these are the two spectra, which match very much. Uh, so I, I would say this is something that uh, is very, very good for these properties. The only part which is not uh, uh, well defined is this one, but this is due to the water molecules. So this is the so-called chirality transfer. You have methyl oxygen plus water around, and then since you, ha you have a chiral arrangement of your system, you see the chirality of water. In general, it's zero in pure water, but in this case, you see the bands. We tried to model, and then we extracted from the snapshots some sphere around the oxygen or methyl oxygen. 
All the water molecules which fall in this sphere are treated quantum mechanically. We, have, we are now at a preliminary investigation, but you immediately realize that whereas the methyloxidine has this very small variability, this is the signal for water. So, you know, maybe we should increase more and more this number to get, uh, hopefully, something which is reliable, okay? This was VCD. We have also Raman and Raman optical activity in the analytical formulation. This is particularly interesting because, you know, we have to average 2,000 snapshots, and if you calculate numerically, you have 17 hours for one. In case of analytical, you have one hour, okay? So this is particularly uh, uh, interesting. In this case, we don't have any experiment for Raman, which is this one, and ROA, which is this one, but we immediately see also in this case that uh, the peaks are completely different in case of uh, VCD or, uh, or uh, PCM, sorry, or uh, uh, FQ. Just uh, since uh, I know that I have only one or two minutes, this is another molecule nicotine. Uh, in this case, uh, with respect to the methyloxidine, we have an additional uh, problem, which is that uh, it lives in two, basically in two conformations. And then uh, what we did uh, is to perform the molecular dynamics, uh, by not, not by fixing the solute, but also by sampling uh, uh, <coughs> the conformational uh, freedom. We did, uh, in this case, uh, electronic circular dichroism. And uh, this is, uh, is the result. So the black is, as usual, the experiment. PCM is blue. Hmm? And you see immediately that here you have a huge overestimation of this peak. Our model is the red one here, which matches uh, much more be better than the experiment. OK, so this is what all I wanted to show you, but last, uh, let me acknowledge the person, the people who have contributed. Uh, the three on top are seated somewhere here. Ivan has maintained uh, the code uh, in the last two years and uh, has developed the TDDFT gradients for the FQ. And uh, Tommaso and Marta, have developed uh, the um, definition of the um, FQ for their derivatives, so Raman and optical activity. Other people were, uh, have been involved. Giordano, also somewhere here in the audience, uh, who is the one performing the, mo the molecular dynamics uh, simulations. Franco was involved uh, in the optical rotation of methyloxidine. Filippo Lipparini originally um, did the, the formulation of the model and the, the, the derivation up to second derivatives. Julien was involved in the optical rotation for an harmonic terms, and uh, Enzo was uh, the one uh, devising uh, all the stuff from the very beginning. Okay, with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> <clears throat> I thank Chiara for her fascinating uh, talk. Now there is time for a couple of questions. A very quick question about um, what is the, ori the origin of the difference between PCM? Because it's focused on uh, some peaks more than others. So it's something that uh, simply due to the orientation of the water molecules. No, it is a specific interaction. So in PCM, you have, uh, if you have any hydrogen bonding, if you have, it is uh, uh, averaged. So it is a mean field. But in this particular case, you have uh, water molecules. I, I would not say fixed because they move, but they maybe are sampled so that uh, more frequently they are in some kind of position around your solute. And this, especially in this case where, you know, these the, this properties arise from the uh, breaking of symmetry. And then, uh, you know, the, 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 in PCM, uh, uh, this breaking of symmetry is something that is due to the cavity. In this case, you have explicitly your solvent molecules, and then uh, it is even huger. 
time eventually for a further question. Please. I may, I may have missed uh, something of what you said, but I, at some point I kind of understood that uh, you are keeping the molecule fixed, and at some other time uh, I've heard you speaking about second derivatives, which make me think that you, you let it run in the harmonic approximation. Uh, what is but what? fixed was that, uh, you know, we performed the molecular dynamics uh, with the fixed methyloxyrene because we wanted to sample the, the solvent around. So not particularly uh, focusing on the motions of the methyloxyrene, which are minor with respect to the rearrangement of the water molecules around. So this was particularly because we wanted to model the chiral imprinting of the solvent around our molecule. We did also with the mobile methyloxyrene. In this case, it doesn't matter so much because it has only one conformation. In the other case, since the nicotine may have at least two different conformations, we decided to, keep, to, to, to leave it uh, free to rotate and so to if, move. Uh, if, if you leave the molecule still, uh, what do you care about the second derivatives? Uh, what do you use second them for? Second derivatives because VCD and Raman optic VCD is formally a second derivative. Uh -huh. Okay, I so see. the second derivative with respect to the uh, quantum mechanical portion. Okay. okay. Okay, if you want to stay in time, we thank Chiara once again. And I call the next speaker from my own university, Mirko Zerbetto, and uh, his talk is titled Conformational Mobility in Monolayer Protected Nanoparticles from Torsional Free Energy Profiles to NMR Relaxation. Arrivo. Good afternoon, I'm Mirko Zerbeto from the University of Padova, and uh, <coughs> um, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the possibility to discuss with you uh, some uh, recent results. Mm, no? no? <laughs> Um, uh, it's a recently published work uh, uh, concerned with the study of conformation and mobility of monolayer protected uh, nanoparticles. And in particular, the target system was uh, a small gold, gold nanoparticle coated uh, with the uh, alkyl tiles, and the alkyl part was uh, decaying, so 10 uh, carbon atoms. Um, the driving force <laughs> of this study was an experimental observation. Uh, our NMR colleagues uh, measured the T1 uh, NMR relaxation time of uh, 13 carbon uh, along the alkyl chain and observed uh, this trend. Uh, carbon atoms closer to the nanoparticle uh, showed some uh, rigid like motion, uh, so rigid uh, regime, sorry, <laughs> while carbon atoms uh, at the end of the chain uh, showed some uh, fluid like regime and uh, atoms in between uh, shown a transition between two, these two limits. So we uh, tried to rationalize these results and we opted for a multi-scale protocol for the description of a quite complicated system. Uh, well, so we started from a, a more or less detailed description of the, of the molecular system, so the nanoparticle, coated nanoparticle, and uh, then uh, selected some uh, relevant degrees of freedom. So we used uh, the, um, the detailed description to parameterize the, the um, coarse-grained description. Well, uh, as relevant dynamics, we selected the overall tumbling of all the molecule, and uh, we, we uh, focused on the internal dynamics of one IQ chain. 
Um, and then uh, once this uh, very reduced in complexity uh, model has been parameterized, we can use the, this uh, um, model to access the long time dynamics of the system and then recover T1 uh, NMR data. Um, so let me uh, say a couple of words uh, on the selection of the internal dynamics, uh, description internal dynamics. So what we do uh, is to describe a, uh, describe a portion of the system, probably the most important portion of the system, and we select, uh, for, um, we follow the internal dynamics, uh, sorry, of uh, a selected aggregate chain. And we neglect uh, all the other degrees of freedom. So where do these other degrees of freedom go? Uh, we take into account these non-relevant set uh, with two contributions. One contribution is on the energetics of the um, probe chain. Um, so it's a kind of entropic correction to the ener energetics. And the other contribution is fluctuation dissipation. Uh, that is, the non-relevant degrees of freedom impose random forces over the relevant ones. Um, so the dynamics of the um, uh, probe chain is not more uh, deterministic, but stochastic. And for example, if we are in the high regime uh, friction, uh, high friction regime, um, we can express this stochastic motion in form of uh, a range van or Brownian dynamics. And two ingre ingre ingredients are very important. And they are the dissipative, the diffusion tensor, which is related to fluctuation dissipation and uh, the potential of mean force, uh, which is the energetics of the um, internal dynamics of the probe chain, uh, expressed in terms of uh, um, torsion angles, theta are the torsion angles, plus a contribution from all the other uh, degrees of freedom that have been dropped out. Um, once these, these two ingredients are viable, then we can perform a long trajectory. For example, we calculated a one microsecond trajectory, Brownian trajectory um, of the in, in internal, um, sorry, uh, the um, Archie chain uh, conf configuration change during time. And uh, uh, from uh, uh, this change in configuration of the chain, we could recover one important information. Um, which is uh, the orientation of uh, a CH bond along uh, the chain with respect to the nanoparticle fixed frame. Um, why it is uh, observable? Because the NMR relaxation uh, depends on the relative orientation of the CH bond and uh, the magnetic field. So while sitting on the nanoparticle, I see one CH bond that changes its orientation with respect to me. Uh, because uh, the chain ch changes its uh, um, geometry. But also, the molecule is rotating, so there is another effort uh, that makes the CH bond change uh, um, its orientation with respect to the magnetic field. And uh, if we put all together, under the approximation of separation of the two motions, okay, it was not necessary, but uh, it was an approximation that proved to work, um, the target uh, observable to calculate is the correlation function G, uh, which is uh, um, um, factorized in two contributions. There is uh, an exponential that depends only on the global motion, and uh, this parameter, D rot, is the rotational diffusion coefficient. And then there is another factor that depends only on internal dynamics. And then uh, in, in the um, red field regime, it is possible to recover NMR parameters. So before jumping to, to the results, I would like to say without uh, details um, a couple of words on the three ingredients that we need, which are, I recall, the free energy, A, the internal dynamics diffusion tensor, and the rotational diffusion. Um, about the um, free energy, we decided to uh, study the free energy profiles along each torsion angle of the chain, so to produce all these uh, nine um, profiles, and then recover the uh, free energy surface. And how to do this? Uh, one has to calculate this integral. If we are looking at free energy profile along these angles theta c, for example, the fifth angle, 
how to perform this integral, where x are all the remaining degrees of freedom. So there are a lot of degrees of freedom. So this integral cannot be directly calculated. There are a, a number of uh, um, workarounds to this problem. What we decided to use is the formalism uh, behind the Justice equality and the Crookes uh, fluctuation theorem, work fluctuation theorem, uh, because we recently uh, developed a, a numerical tool that we call Jeffrey. Um, um, Jeffrey uh, has proved that the, the ability to give reliable uh, free energy profiles in presence of high barriers, of high energetic barriers of tens of, of kT. So this is why we use this route. And uh, um, the um, free energy profiles are, are uh, worthy to be discussed uh, later. Uh, well, this is the, the first panel, is the uh, profile, uh, a free energy profile along the SC bond. Uh, and one can see that uh, this bond is pr practically fixed, blocked. It's just a wobbling around uh, zero degrees. While uh, in the other panels, uh, you can see a number of uh, um, um, profiles with the error bars. These are the free energy estimations. Why the dotted line is the free energy for the rotation around the, the central bond of normal butane. And you can see that in, in practically in all the cases, the second angle, this is the third one, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. In all the cases but the third angle, all the profiles resemble that of normal butane. So we decided to do this approximation. That is the free energy surface is that the, the sum of normal butane-like uh, potentials. It's quite crude uh, approximation. I can do some more sophisticated things, but uh, okay, it worked. So we stopped at this level of approximation. Um, I will say a couple of words about the dissipative properties. I'm not going into details, but uh, for what concerns the internal dynamics, we use the standard hydrodynamic approach. I just want to. Um, um, underline this problem, uh, the friction, mm -hmm, okay. the friction uh, depends on the viscosity of the monolayer. Now the question is, uh, which is this viscosity? <laughs> so uh, I'm coming back to this question um, in a few moments. Uh, and while for the global tumbling of the molecule, well, this was quite simple because uh, it's just a sphere rotating into an isotropic medium, the only, um, we had only to pay attention to one thing, that this is a, a, a breathing sphere. So the effective radius of the sphere was calculated as the radius of the gold core plus uh, an average elongation of the Archie chains, which is this R10 averaged. And uh, um, um, we were able to calculate the translational diffusion coefficient to be compared with uh, um, experimentally de de determined. And they are comparable. Uh, you see 3.5 versus 5.4, so we were happy. Uh, <laughs> could say that this uh, effective radius could be realistic. Okay, jumping to the, uh, these are the results. So uh, here I'm showing you in black are the calculated T1 uh, um, relaxation times, while in red the experimental ones. Um, the agreement is very good, at least uh, um, within the experimental error. I want just to um, uh, say that in this case, for atoms three, four, five, six, uh, there was a, an experimental problem. Uh, uh, people could not distinguish the, the, uh, the signals, so they gave us only an average way, while uh, theoretically we, we can uh, um, distinguish, of course. And uh, uh, I want to show you that uh, these results were obtained using, uh, as uh, the viscosity of the monolayer, the viscosity of the uh, decantile. So it turned out that the, the, the viscosity, giving the bad agreement with the uh, experimental data, uh, was the same as the acrylation chains uh, were free and formed the liquid. So to conclude, um, this uh, work, uh, it was a six months uh, project uh, because we had to, to build uh, all the computational, computational tools uh, and at the end, uh, proved to be predictive since we used no fitting parameters 
to recover NMR data. And uh, from our results, uh, we can say that, for example, the equilibrium distribution of the monolayer resembles just the equilibrium distribution of normal butane. It's a very simple <laughs> conclusion. And uh, uh, the monolayer behaves like a highly mobile pseudo phase with the same viscosity as the liquid. It's a not very intuitive result, <laughs> but it came from the model. Um, and uh, I just want to say uh, that a perspective. Uh, since the model shows to be good, <laughs> I can say, um, we decided, we are asking if we, uh, it would be possible to uh, produce a free energy for the force field database to be used to make this kind of calculations, so Brownian dynamics of systems similar to this one, or, uh, uh, well, similar, because uh, portability <laughs> could be not mu much uh, extended. Um, so I um, would like to finish by thanking uh, all the uh, collaborators to this project, especially Andrea Piserkia, who did the most of the work, <laughs> and uh, of course uh, my department for the HPC resources and Mio for funding, and all of you for your attention. I thank Dr. Zerbito for his talk. There is time just for one question. If there is, there isn't. Okay, we thank again Dr. Zerbeto. And, and we move to the uh, next speaker, Alberto Bayardi, uh, of the Scuola Normale Superiore, who will talk about DVR uh, based approaches for the simulation of vibronic spectra and of flexible systems. to work. Okay. <laughs> I can speak about the laptop or <laughs> Okay, <laughs> perfect. I will try to be fast to recover the time. So it's a pleasure for me to talk here about the work we are doing in our group here in Pisa uh, regarding the simulation of vibration result spectra of uh, flexible systems, so to uh, 
to tackle also larger and larger system. And more in detail about uh, a method we developed in order to uh, treat large amplitude motion in an efficient way. So uh, after giving a brief presentation of the general framework we usually use to simulate vibronic spectra, I will describe how it, it is important, why, uh, why it's important to switch from the Cartesian representation to the internal Cartesian representation and uh, how this allows us to use this DVR approach in order to incre increase the accuracy of, uh, of our methods. And then we conclude with some pilot application we are doing in this month. So here we are talking about vibration result spectra. So uh, spectroscopy involving transition uh, in the electronic range, but in which the effect of the vibration of the nuclei is relevant. And this effect is relevant for different kinds of spectroscopies. Of course, the use of absorption and emission one, their car optical counterpart, as well as vibrational spectroscopies like the resonance Raman one, which involves the different electronic states. And for all these kind of the spectroscopies, uh, the spectra can be simulated within two different frameworks. I won't go much into the details, but uh, the first one is the so-called time-independent frameworks in which the spectra is obtained by summing all the, over all the individual vibronic contribution. Uh, the efficient way, especially when temperature and, uh, effect are included, is to simulate the spectra using the parallel time-dependent formulation in which the spectra is obtained at uh, the a Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function, which it can be computed at the harmonic level. In order to use either the first or, or the second uh, approach, some approximation must be introduced. And what is usually done is to uh, use the so-called Dushinsky transformation to relate the normal modes of the two electronic states involved in the transition. And since the the intensities of the peaks depend on the electric transition dipole moment, and this quantity is not known with analytical formula, usually. Uh, a Taylor expansion is usually employed where the zero torr term is referred to as a uh, Frank Condon terms, but we can go further and include uh, first order, second order terms. And the, the main approximation which is usually introduced is the harmonic approximation for both the potential energy surface involved in the electronic transition. And uh, so uh, the limitation of the harmonic approximation is that the, the representation of the potential energy surface is local. So uh, uh, either we can use the so-called vertical models or the so-called adiabatic models for the excited state PS. In each case, we are doing an harmonic approximation of the potential energy surface, and so we are describing correctly the PS only locally. And going toward flexible system, which can undergo large amplitude motions, like for example torsions or ring inversion or NH2 inversion and so on, this local representation is no more, uh, uh, is, uh, is limited. And uh, we can see it when trying to perform computation on a simple uh, flexible system like b thiophin This is the simulated fluorescence spectra of the system. And uh, going from the S1 state, which is the emissive one, to the S0 state, there is a change of the dihedral angle between the two rings of about 20 degrees. And uh, uh, this deformation is described not correctly with all the approximation introduced above. And this can be seen in the final result we are getting because the, uh, the, vibra the, the band shape has several uh, high intensity peaks which are not, not present in the experimental data. And, but why the, for such system this, uh, the results are so bad? Because the PS along, along such large amplitude motions, like torsion in this case, is usually pretty flat. And uh, so upon electronic excitation, the molecule can have a large amplitude distortion of, uh, along this motion, such in this case the 20 degrees the, the deformation. And uh, so the harmonic approximation is ill-suited for treating such large amplitude deformations. And we, go, we have to go. Uh, we have to include in some way an harmonic effect. 
The problem is that the Cartesian representation is a limitation here to include the harmonic effect because as you can see here, the coupling of the torsional mode with the other modes is very high. Here we have the, rep the graphical representation of the so-called uh, C matrix, which is involved in the computation of Frank Condon integrals. And without uh, going into details, what C tells you is that if C is uh, very sparse, like in this case, it is likely that you will have a simultaneous, simultaneous excitation of different modes uh, in, the, in the vibronic spectrum. On the other hand, if you have a diagonal C matrix, the coupling within the, uh, between the different modes will be limited, and so it's unlikely to have I mean, simultaneous excitation of different modes. And in this case, as you can see here, the Cartesian representation gives a very sparse C matrix. This means there's, there is a huge coupling of the torsional mode with other modes. And so to go beyond the, the harmonic approximation and include the harmonic terms, we have to treat at the harmonic level different modes, not only the torsion, but all the other ones which are coupled to this one. So in order to develop efficient methods to overcome this limitation of the Cartesian representation, we can use and switch to another representation, which is the internal coordinates one, where the vibration are described not in terms of Cartesian coordinates, but in terms of bonds, distances, angles, dihedrals, out of plane possibility, and so on. And also from chemical intuition, we can understand that the, such a coordinate system gives a, be, a better description of motion, like torsions. But it's pretty tri tricky to understand why something changes in uh, vibronic spectroscopy using internal coordinates instead of the Cartesian one, already at the harmonic level. Since, for example, for infrared spectroscopy or vibrational ground state spectroscopies where we have a single potential energy surface, the results we get at the harmonic level does not depend on the coordinate system which is used. For vibronic spectroscopy, uh, the situation is pretty different because already at the harmonic level we have a significant improvement or anyway uh, we have changes using internal coordinates with respect to the Cartesian ones. And this is because we have two different geometries. The geometry of the ground state and the geometry of the excited states. And the di geometry difference between those two geometries is finite, is not a small difference. And such a finite difference is described differently using different coordinate systems. And what in practical uh, change is the definition of the Dushinsky transformation. Because the, uh, the Dushinsky matrix J and the shift vector K is different if you use Cartesian or internal coordinates. Uh, I won't go into details of the implementation in our code of this framework, but just to just want to tell you that the, we use as internal coordinates this so-called delocalized internal coordinates since they are pretty easy to use because they need just, you just need the molecular topology to build these coordinates. And so it's easy to automatize this procedure. And once you d define the Dushinsky transformation in a, this different way, you can use the same formulation as before to compute the Frank Condon integrals and include vibronic effects. And here, is the same matrix as before, going to the internal representation. And you can see that now the matrix is more diagonal. This means that the torsional mode is no more coupled with the other modes. And so it is possible to treat it at a different level with respect to the other ones. And since this is a monodimensional problem, we just have the torsion, we can use high accuracy uh, uh, monodimensional variational methods to compute the vibrational levels and uh, wave function along those, this mode. And what we use to perform this variational calculation is the discrete variable representation theory, DVR. And the idea is to scan the potential energy surface along the large amplitude motion, so compute the energy of different value, for example, of the torsional angle, so we get a representation of the PES and then solve the vibrational Schrodinger equation along this mode uh, using a finite basis expansion. And as a basis set, we use the DVR basis set. And the main advantage of this basis set is that they are 
th this, those functions are centered in the point in which the energy is computed. And the, uh, the, the, they have been, the DVR have been applied in a wide range of problems. They, the, they change with the different boundary condition of the problem. So it, uh, uh, torsion uh, for periodic boundary condition is different with respect to other boundary condition. And the main advantage is that the potential energy is diagonal in this basis, whereas the kinetic energy is not. Anyway, we can build the Hamiltonian matrix in this basis, diagonalize it, and get the vibrational energies and the vibrational wave functions. Once we have the vibrational wave function for the ground state and the excited state, we can compute the overlap between them and compute the Frank, so compute the Frank condom factors. Actually, we can go further and compute the, trans, the, the transition dipole moment between the two wave functions. And this is virtually exact in the sense that we don't have to perform any Taylor expansion. And we can do it for, for the electric dipole moment, magnetic dipole moment, and so possible extension to chiroptical properties. So the, this is the computational procedure we use to, to compute the, in practice the Frank Condon factors. And then once you have the Frank Condon factor for the large amplitude motion, you have to convolute it with the other n minus one motion, uh, vibrational motion. But the convolution is pretty simple since as we said before, the, the torsional motion is independent on the other one, so the Frank Condon factor just factorizes. These are the results in internal coordinates for the same system as before, so by beta iofin. The, uh, the red one is the spectrum with just n minus one normal mode, so without including torsion. The green one is the one in which the torsion has, include, has been included at the DVR level. As you can see here, since the spectrum is the low, the resolution of the spectrum is low, there is just a slight redistribution of intensities. But if we go, for example, to we compare with the Cartesian case, both including or excluding the torsion, the results are, uh, the agreement is really bad. And uh, if we go to high resolution spectroscopies, in which the single vibronic bands involving the torsion can be detected, and uh, it is possible also to select the initial state for the fluorescence, we can see that the agreement of the Frank Condon factor for this torsional mode is quite, uh, is satisfactory both in the position and in the intensities. So the, uh, I've briefly described how it's possible to uh, extend the theoretical framework we usually use to simulate vibronic spectra at the, using Cartesian coordinates to internal coordinates and why it is important to extend this framework to support uh, monodimensional harmonic models. And uh, those uh, anharmonic treatment is required to have uh, reliable results for large amplitude motions, such as torsion in this case. And uh, we are working on a full automatization of the computational procedure in order to I mean, uh, automatically detect the large amplitude motion and correct the results. It is important to extend it to multi-dimensional problem, so two or more large amplitude motions, and extend also it also to ACD, VCD, resonance Raman, so more exotic uh, spectroscopies. So I uh, thank you for your attention. I am open for questions. I thank Dr. Bayardi for his talk. There is once again time for just one question. Please. Uh, the, I mean, the first step is to compute the, uh, the, the, spec, the harmonic spectrum in internal coordinates and see the, if there are modes which are highly C shifted, perform a potential energy distribution and detect the coordinates involved in the, in the transition. Let's say. Is short your question, Mirka? Uh, we, uh, I, I, I'm not gone into, into details. Uh, we can use hundreds, but this not, does not mean that you have to perform hundreds of single point calculations. Since we perform the DVR on a fitted potential energy surfaces on the base of the single point calculation, 
quantum mechanical calculations. Dr. Bayardi. And the next speaker is Dr. Caprasecca uh, from the University of Pisa. And uh, he will talk about uh, excitonic states and plasmonics, a uh, multi scale approach. Organizers for having me here, and I have changed the title of the talk a bit. This is a bit fancier. Uh, it's excitons uh, meet plasmonic antennae, but it's basically on the same uh, thing. Um, I am. Um, I will be presenting the work that has been done at the University of Pisa in the molecular group of Professor Menucci, and uh, I will talk about basically when. Uh, excitonic systems such as the light harvesting, some light harvesting complexes, are, um, their properties are modified, are tuned by the presence of plasmons nearby. Okay, so <clears throat> light harvesting complexes, we all know that they perform some, um, they are antennae that absorb light and transfer the energy very efficiently even in, um, for long distances. And they um, eventually, for example, the, the LH2 complex that I will be describing, transfer it to a reaction center where charge separation occurs. But in, in, in this study, the LH2 is isolated. So it absorbs light, it transfers it internally, and then it emits it by fluorescing. And the plasmons are very interesting systems because, for example, when you take a metal nanoparticle, for instance, gold or uh, silver, in this case we have gold, they can have these, the plasmons are collective excitations on the surface. And so around the, the metal nanoparticle, there is a very high, in case of resonance, there is a high, very high local electric field that can tune the optical properties of nearby molecules. And we would like to, we started, this, this work has been triggered by some experimental studies by Van Hulst and collaborators who showed that the LH2 system uh, close to certain metal nanoparticles, gold metal nanorods, can have a fluorescence enhancement of two orders of magnitudes and nearly three in some cases. So we would like to try to reproduce these results and see if we can gain some extra information from this simulation. Now the system is, the LH2 system is this one, is quite large, well, everything is relative, but it, it's, I would say that it's quite large, and it's very symmetric. It's made up by 27 identical pigments that are the bacteriochlorophylls that absorb light, and these are our chromophores. And it, it has a C9 symmetry, and the chlorophylls form two rings. Uh, the, the, the blue ring um, down, uh, which is formed by nine bacteriochlorophylls, which are weakly coupled because they are quite distant. While the other bacteriochlorophylls, the 18 bacter purple bacteriochlorophylls on the top, they are very closely spaced and so very strongly coupled. And this whole system has a very clear excitonic signature. So despite having different chromophores that absorb and all of them are identical, it shows a um, a signature of the excitonic nature of its uh, optical properties. For example, in the absorption spectrum, you see two peaks that are the two peaks coming from the two, um, uh, two excitonic states. And another information that the, um, and the, the absorption, the first absorption peak at 800 nanometers, the blue chlorophylls are responsible for those, the blue ring, while for the 850 nanometers peak, the other ring is responsible for that. And as you can see, the fluorescence is only from this peak. So even if, you, um, even if the, this ring absorbs light, then it transfers very fast 
uh, the, the transfer rate is, uh, is uh, the time is uh, less than one picosecond to the other ring which emits in our case. In real case, actually, it transfers to other reaction centers. Now, how can we treat these big systems? Well, we resort to a quantum mechanical description of the chlorophylls because they interact with light, so we need to treat them quantum mechanically, and we use a TDDFT approach. For, the, for what concerns the rest of the, of the protein, we resort to a polarizable embedding scheme similar to what Chiara mentioned before. But in this case, the um, environment is described as a set of charges, fixed charges, and induced dipoles. So it is polarizable as well, but it's based on dipoles that can be induced. So that is the polarization of the environment. And finally, the metal nanoparticle, which I show here as a huge uh, black um, circle, is uh, represented using a modified version of the PCM, or the polarizable continuum model, by using a, um, a complex uh, um, dielectric constant. This is a modified version that has been developed in my group. So, the QM subsystem, even if we get rid of all the environment, still the QM subsystem is too large. So we, we resort to an excitonic scheme. What we do is we treat each bacterial chlorophyll independently in the presence of all the rest of the bacterial chlorophylls and the protein as a polarizable MM. And for each, we compute the, the site energy, so the, the, the excitation energy of the, the first state, so the QY transition of the chlorophyll, plus all the electronic couplings. And we build this way the excitonic matrix, which is the top part here. So you see there are all the bacterial chlorophylls, B800 and B850, and here the same bacterial chlorophylls, and you see how they couple with each other. These are the electronic couplings, while the site energies are on the diagonal. If you diagonalize this, you obtain a set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The eigenvalues are the excitonic energies, and the eigenvectors are the excitons, the excitonic states. And in particular here, in the, all the rows are excitonic states, and the columns are the contribution of each excitonic state from each bacterial chlorophyll. So in particular, I divide the first nine, but nine columns are the B800 bacterial chlorophylls, the blue ones, and the last six, 18 are the B850. And as you can see, the um, exitons are made, the, the, there are many, there are many uh, exitonic schemes that we have used. I'm just presenting one because I don't have time. Um, but you can see that the, exit, the, the exitonic states are very delocalized over the whole ring. And in particular, out of these excitonic states, only four have a non-negligible dipole strength. And there are two here, two degenerate states here, which are responsible for this, and are delocalized, as the experiments say, on the B800 uh, bacterial chlorophyll, B800 ring, and the, uh, these, other, the, these purple ones that are responsible for this peak here. Now, these states can be represented very well and very effectively, effectively, even for what concerns their interaction with the metal, by using their transition dipoles. And they basically are, the transition dipoles of the two couples are uh, perpendicular to, to each other and lie on the plane of the rings. So they are really, uh, par, uh, they, are, they, they are lying on the plane of the two rings. Now, how do we... Um, model the metal nanoparticle. We use 11 interlocking spheres and use a um, complex um, uh, dielectric constant. And we put the molecule, the LH2 molecule, either in the hot, on the tip of this nanorod or on the surface. And these are surface configurations and not spot configurations. We, use, uh, we reproduce the experimental cross-section, um, which has been fitted. Uh, we actually fit that. And we scan different distances from between the LH2 and the metal nanorod and different tilt angles between the LH2 C9 axis and the metal nanoparticle axis. And what we obtain, uh, we, we, we then build a kinetic model for the whole system. So we have two uh, absorbing states, two emissive states. These states can be populated uh, through some absorption coefficients, some absorption rate, and they can then, they can, the, their population can be transferred by a, 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 um, energy transfer to the lower states, or it can be, this energy can be dissipated radiatively or non-radiatively. And, and we can 
rationalize all these results in terms of an enhancement of the absorption given by the metal and an enhancement of the emission again given by the metal. And their product gives us the enhancement of the fluorescence in general. And I would just like to point out the absorption and radiative decay rates are proportional to the total dipole moment. So the metal effectively can tune this by inducing a dipole moment, an, an induced dipole moment. And while the uh, electronic energy transfer rate from the absorbing to the emissive states is proportional to the coupling. Now what you, no, this is too fast. What you obtain is that the absorption enhancement, when the tilt angle is zero, the absorption is quenched, and so is the uh, emission. So when the, tilt, when the two um, axes are parallel, then the, the metal nanorod axis is perpendicular to the two um, dipole moments of the, um, of the excitonic states, and so both the, ex, um, excitation, the absorption and the excitations are quenched, and the fluorescence enhancement go, goes to zero. But as soon as you tilt the angle a bit, you obtain a huge fluorescence enhancement of nearly two orders of magnitude. When you increase the distance, of course, there's a decay. Now, you can explain all, all this, but that I don't have time because I went too long, uh, in terms of the two transition dipoles, which I told you before, the, two ca the couple for the absorption and the couple for the emission. And when the metal is close but perpendicular to these dipoles, it basically reduces, shrinks to zero, the total dipole moment so that the absorption and the emission are quenched. In the other case, instead, it is they are enhanced. I, I, um, this would be nice, but I don't have time. So in general, we are, we are able to reproduce the experimental results also, also quantitatively in terms of uh, uh, without using this multi-scale approach. And we also learned something about how the energy is absorbed, transferred, and emitted finally. And uh, we did this in terms of excitonic dipoles, so in a very simple picture that resulted, the, the, the initial uh, setting was not simple in general. And uh, um, we are trying to, um, we, we are working on like time dependence of this, uh, of this by running uh, dynamics. And uh, we also um, learned much uh, by learning on the different, the different results that we obtain using different excitonic models. And I would like to thank, uh, well, my group, in particular, Benedetta Menucci and uh, Dr. Ciro Guido and Marco Campedella that uh, uh, shared with me the work and all the molecular group and you for your attention. Okay, we thank Dr. Capraseca. There is time for a couple of questions. Please. Where do the coupling parameters in your excitonic model come from? Yeah, that, that's a good question because in general, if you diagonalize the whole matrix, you get a diagonal thing. So there are no of diagonal terms which correspond. To it. Well, it depends. In this excitonic approach, I diagonalized actually the two B800 and B850 blocks separately. So I obtain, in fact, you can see that the excitons are pure. They are either on one ring or on the other. And this is artificial in a sense, because I, I diagonalized both matrices. And doing that, you obtain not only p sort of pure excitons, but you also obtain cross terms. So couplings, like sort of super couplings between excitonic states. Any other questions? If I understand well, you use a purely local field uh, uh, effect for your nanoparticle. Is there any chemical effect? Do you think that is, is relevant? Uh, it, in the experiment, is, it was ruled out because they used a sort of coating over the nanoparticles so that the, there wasn't any chemical, uh, chemical effect. And we, we were very happy to have that because we would be in trouble otherwise. Okay, we thank Dr. Capraseca, we move. <laughs> and we move to the last speaker of this uh, session, uh, Dr. Pomelli. Uh, his talk is titled The Mechanism of the Aerobic Oxidation of Aldehydes Catalyzed by N Heterocycle Carbenes.
Okay, I'm very happy to speak at the winter modeling. I was uh, in Sala Azzurra uh, uh, at the same time year about 26 years ago for the welcome reception for new students of, of Scuola Normale. The time uh, uh, is <laughs> some, t some time ago. And uh, is, um, an, uh, I present an integrated uh, uh, computational uh, um, experimental study on uh, an organic reaction, the n carbenes oxidation of aldehydes by atmospheric environmental oxygen. And uh, is, um, uh, I am part of uh, uh, ionic liquids group uh, at the University of Pisa, group leader is Professor, is Professor Cinzia Chiappe. Uh, some time ago, we uh, the experimental part of the group synthesized some dicationic ionic liquids. Normally, um, standard ionic liquids uh, are sometimes like an alpha of this dicationic molecular using uh, with a, a simple synthesis, uh, right, more complex are uh, yes, normal ionic liquids, but not so difficult. We can obtain uh, duplicationic uh, uh, synthesis for uh, obtaining vis viscoelastic properties and different projects. But uh, we see that the cationic can easily lost a proton and uh, uh, go to a charge labeled carbon. Uh, charge labeled, why? B because uh, an uh, a molecule with a charge is visible to in easy mass spectroscopy, and thus we can uh, a snapshot of the, the carbene on evolution of the carbene during the reaction. And the uh, experiment shows that the activity and the catalytic property are the same of the simple non-charge lab of the carbene. This is an, an example of uh, is the mass spectra, we can see both the uh, decharged uh, species with the cationic and the uh, charged lipid carbine, are both visible in a uh, mass, easy mass spectrum. Reaction scheme is quite complex, but uh, we focus uh, mainly on uh, the Breslov intermediate, is uh, the main intermediate of all the reaction, is uh, product of addition of carbene to aldehyde, and uh, is oxidation with uh, oxygen. Uh, and, uh, experimental uh, evidence is that uh, for very similar substrates, uh, like uh, uh, orthobromobenzene, follow a path called the oxidative path, they react with another aldehyde and uh, leading to two carboxylic acids. And the uh, uh, para-substitute go to oxygenative pattern. The oxidized Breslau intermediate lost an hydroperoxidic ion, leading to a species that can react with a nucleophile, like a methanol molecule. The wall reaction is carried out in methanol, leading to something uh, derived from carbonylic uh, uh, compounds in an, an ester, a methyl ester in our case. Is, is, uh, what these two very similar substrates show different uh, reaction, uh, uh, follow different reaction paths. And the, this, this uh, work is an uh, occasion to uh, try a new software, TerraCam software, and uh, it's a commercial software, and uh, one of the first uh, density functional package based, based on uh, graphical process units. Have, it's a very simple uh, implementation. We have uh, energy gradients, uh, optimization, a uh, few more uh, features. But uh, we, we, we can, it's very efficient, very fast uh, in, uh, on a desktop uh, computer or a small servers. And uh, use a slightly different method to study reaction parties, Nagel elastic band, which is mainly used in uh, molecular dynamics, uh, packages, uh, something similar. And uh, we can introduce uh, five species of methanol molecules, and there is no continuum solvent implemented. And we found uh, some uh, uh, specific actions, uh, roles of the solvent molecules. 
And the first piece is an encounter complex between the carbene and the aldehyde. It is not a reaction. The carbonyl group and the carbene group are coordinated by methanol molecules. This is a, uh, the starting of the compositional study. We have two reagent fetching with uh, two aromatic rings uh, um, nearly parallel. And uh, we studied the first reaction, the formation of uh, the alkylate of the intermediate four. Uh, this is a different uh, angulation of the same uh, intermediate. And this is a reaction path optimized with the Nudged Elastic Band method. There are small uh, energetic difference between or the par, not uh, enough to discriminate for the uh, different reaction paths. And this is a climbing image, you know, it's is an analogous of uh, transition state uh, when the whole uh, path is optimized. I image climb along the path to find the point high turn energy, it's the equivalent of transition states. And in the climb image, there is an angle, it's not, the two rings are not more parallel. There's some degree of polymerization of the sp2 atom, uh, of the carbonyl group. This is an ortho, uh, this is a paraisomer. And there is an uh, orthisomer, this is a paraisomer, and paraisomer is slight uh, more uh, perimalized, but it's not a great difference uh, in the structures. This leads to, to alkylate, as first in the intermediate tree. Tre the structure is uh, very different. Uh, the two rings uh, are bound on, on, on our band on semi-carbon atom. And uh, uh, this time I have to move the aldehyde hydrogen to the oxygen to turn to uh, enol, this is the Brazil of intermediate. It's uh, a uh, polarity inversion in this process. The step is uh, Slight uh, is uh, endothermic, but uh, the wall process is exothermic, and uh, we seek the next step uh, can drive uh, the reaction in, in its process, progress. And uh, at the same time, a slight difference in, uh, between uh, the energetic of two, two isomers. This is a uh, uh, detail of the structure. The transfer of proton of course, with uh, a two metal bridge. There is an, uh, this ring of metal, so we see all the rings of uh, metal exchanging their uh, protons uh, in the next steps of the reaction. And this we can paste for an alkylate. The clinging image is very similar to the products. We can see that is very near to the product, near to the reagents. And uh, in, in the, we have repeated experiments with uh, deuterated methanol, methyl uh, OD, and we see the peaks corresponding to the exchange of a proton with uh, methanol in the intermediate. This is the, the transmediate and not directly transfer of methanol, of a uh, proton by methanol, is the most active experiments. There are studies on the same reaction on no protic uh, solvents like uh, carbon trichloride, uh, something similar. In, in the case, there is not a change of hydrogen, but in methanol, it is a core. Uh, now we will go to the step of oxidation of Bresol intermediate with uh, uh, molecular oxygen. It's a tri triplet state oxygen. This is a barrierless reaction. I try, I try to capture an intermediate and a counter complex. No, it's not a way the oxygen go directly to the PI system here and uh, start the oxidation. And uh, in this step, we can discriminate in a qualitative way between the two isomers. Uh, 
in case of ortho, there is a superprosthetic uh, structures. Uh, there are, in para, there is an hydroperosidic structure. This uh, preclude the further reaction with another aldehyde molecules and the oxygen, oxygenative PET, but, and uh, uh, this only way to evolve to final products is lost uh, an hydroperosid ion and uh, go to, tra, through the oxidative path. This uh, is the first uh, result of the uh, reaction. There is some similar, uh, similar between the single occupied orbitals of the T structure is still in, in this triplet state uh, on and uh, bromobenzene uh, orbitals, which skips this part. Uh, and uh, in easy mass pattern, we see this structure of oxidative Breslov, the normal Breslov, and uh, a monoxygenate Breslov, on a Breslov with a single atom oxygen. This uh, we can, uh, this is a part of exit of uh, hydroperoxid, the, the hydroperoxid uh, start from this carbon, this now is passed to carbonyl and exit uh, like an uh, uh, hydrogen dioxide uh, here. And uh, in, uh, when the, the reaction uh, involves uh, uh, an uh, another aldehyde molecules, we go through and uh, uh, superoxid, uh, peroxidic bridge, we, we think that uh, the single oxygenated blaze of intermediate uh, is a result of uh, cleavage of uh, this bridge on, on half, and uh, this can evolve uh, into carboxylic acid molecules uh, like the oxygen, uh, oxygenative path. And uh, the conclusion is we have a first uh, uh, information of the why one is omer follower and part and why the another the other and uh, we have work in progress with different use and different heterocycles. Uh, it is uh, a collaboration with the Ionic Liquids Group from the University of Pisa are the first uh, five names names and uh, Easy Mass Group from the University of Ferrara and uh, uh, some preliminary result has been published in Kencom last year. Thank you for your time. Thank Dr. Pomelli for his contribution. There is time just for a couple of questions, very short. There is not frequent calculation in the code. I check, ah, uh, uh, no, I check uh, uh, one structure with Gauss and with the same, the function at the same level, there is, is, it, is, it, is it, yes. Question? Well, I thank once again uh, Dr. Pomelli. <laughs> I, I thank all the speakers, I thank the audience, and obviously I give the talk to uh, the chair for the conclusions. Well, it is uh, quite strange to make the conclusion in English, but anyway, since we've been all made all the uh, conference in English, I will continue uh, in this way. Uh, there is not so uh, many things I would like to say, simply um, saying that uh, I guess it will be uh, in another edition next year. I would like to have some proposal for having an edition outside the Scuola Normale, because from time to time this happens. For instance, in Padua, which promises several times. <laughs> Just I have seen two people from Padua. Uh, uh, but we will have something in uh, uh, winter of uh, next year. Uh, apart from that, I'm uh, always very happy with uh, this kind of, uh, of meeting, not only because uh, I am among the first organizers of the meeting, but, but essentially because it allows to see a number of friends in a quite relaxed atmosphere and uh, to know a number of young people uh, having uh, the possibility of speaking in a quite relaxed way and to present the results. Uh, for sure, I've uh, uh, heard a number of interesting uh, uh, scientific contribution, but that's uh, uh, 
quite expected from the main speakers, which uh, were selected uh, uh, carefully. carefully. <laughs> Thanks for the <laughs> for the word. But uh, also the, the the younger one, uh, have, uh, at least from my perspective, have given a number of new ideas and new approaches, which are by no means trivial and by no means and by no means obvious. And I have not so much uh, to to add to that, except for uh, thanking you for being here and giving you a warm welcome for the next edition. Please give us any idea you, you want, apart from the, the location, which can be SNS, but uh, it is not important. But if you have ideas for changing something in the format of for uh, uh, other things or a specific teams to be developed or whatever, it would be nice to have that, because uh, the, the, for the remaining part, the organization is quite simple and uh, can be performed without uh, uh, many, uh, so much effort. And thank you for being here.